Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. I'm Lucas Perry. Today's episode is with Daniela and Dario Amade, and in it we explore Anthropic. For those not familiar, Anthropic is a new AI safety and research company that's working to build reliable, interpretable, and steerable AI systems. Their view is that large general AI systems of today can have significant benefits, but can also be unpredictable, unreliable, and opaque. Their goal is to make progress on these issues through research and down the road create value commercially and for public benefit. Daniela and Dario join us to discuss the mission of Anthropic, their perspective on AI safety, their research strategy, as well as what it's like to work there and the positions they're currently hiring for. Daniela Amade is a co-founder and is the president of Anthropic. She was previously at Stripe and OpenAI and has also served as a congressional staffer. Dario Amade is CEO and is also a co-founder of Anthropic. He was previously at OpenAI, Google, and Baidu. Dario also holds a PhD in biophysics from Princeton University. Before we jump into the interview, we have a few announcements to make. If you've tuned into any of the previous two episodes, then you can skip ahead just a bit. The first announcement is that I'll be moving on from my role as host of the FLI podcast. And this means two things. The first is that FLI is hiring for a new host for the podcast. As host, you would be responsible for the guest selection, interviews, production, and publication of the FLI podcast. If you're interested in applying for this position, you can head over to the careers tab at futureoflife.org for more information. We also have another four job openings currently for a human resources manager an editorial manager, an EU policy analyst, and an operations specialist. You can learn more about those at the careers tab as well. The second item is that even though I'll no longer be host of the FLI podcast, I won't be disappearing from the podcasting space. I'm starting a brand new podcast that'll be focused on exploring questions around philosophy, wisdom, science, and technology where you'll see many of the same themes you can find here, like existential risk and AI alignment. I'll have more details about my new podcast soon. If you'd like to stay up to date, you can follow me on Twitter at LucasFMPerry, link in the description. And with that, I'm happy to present this interview with Daniela and Dario Amade on Anthropic. It's really wonderful to have you guys here on the podcast. I'm super excited to be learning all about Anthropic. Um, so we can start off here with a pretty simple question. And so, you know, what was the intention behind forming Anthropic? Yeah, cool. Well, first of all, Lucas, thanks so much for, for having us on the show. We've been really looking forward to it. We're super pumped to be here. So I guess maybe I'll, I'll kind of start with this one. So just to kind of, yeah, why did we start Anthropic? To kind of give a little history here and sort of set the stage, we were founded about a, a year ago at the beginning of, of 2021, and it was originally a team of, of seven people who kind of moved over together from, from OpenAI. And uh, for listeners or viewers who kind of don't very viscerally remember this time period, it was like the middle of the pandemic. So most people were not eligible to be, you know, vaccinated yet. And so when, you know, all of us wanted to kind of get together and and talk about anything, we had to like get together in someone's backyard or outdoors and be six feet apart and wear masks. And so it was generally just like a really uh, interesting time to be to be kind of starting a, a company. But why, you know, why did we found Anthropic? What was, what was the thinking there? I think, you know, sort of the best way I would, I would describe it is because we, all of us kind of wanted the opportunity to make a focused research bet with a small set of people who were highly aligned kind of around a uh, very coherent vision of AI research and, and AI safety. So, the majority of our employees had kind of worked together in, in like one format or another in the past. So, you know, I think our team is kind of known for work like, you know, GPT-3 or uh, Deep Dream, Chris Ola worked on at, at Google Brain for scaling laws. But we'd also done a lot of different uh, safety research together in, in, in different organizations that, as well. So uh, multimodal neurons, uh, when we were at OpenAI, concrete problems in AI safety and, and sort of a lot of others. But this group had kind of worked together in uh, in different companies at, at Google Brain, at OpenAI, in academia, um, in startups, 
previously, and we really just wanted the opportunity to kind of get that group together to do this focused kind of research bet of building, you know, steerable, interpretable, and reliable AI systems uh, with humans at the center of them. Yeah, just to just to add a little bit to that, I mean, I think you know we're we were we're I think we're all a bunch of you know like fairly kind of empirically minded, exploration driven driven people, but you who also think and care a lot about about AI safety. I think that characterizes, you know, all all seven of us. If you if you add together, you know, having, you know, either working at OpenAI, working together at Google Brain in the past, uh, many of us work together in the physicists in the physics community and we're, you know, cur- current current or former physicists. If you add if you add all that together, I mean it's a set of people who have kind of known each other for a long time and, you know, have been aware of thinking and arguments about AI safety and have worked on them over the years, kind of always with an empirical bent, ranging from, you know, interpretability on like language models and vision models to, you know, working on the original RL from human preferences, concrete problems and AI safety, um, and also characterizing scaling and how scaling works and how that's um, uh, kind of, uh, yeah, how, how we think of that as somewhat, somewhat central to the way AI is going to progress and shapes the landscape for how to, how to, solve, uh, how to solve safety. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, a, a year ago, we were all working at OpenAI and sort of, you know, trying to make this focus bet on, you know, basically scaling plus safety or, you know, or safety, safety with, a, with a lens towards scaling being a big part of the path to, to AGI. Um, and, yeah, well, I mean, we felt we were making this focus bet kind of within a, within a larger organization and it just eventually came to the conclusion that it would be great to have an organization that, like, top to bottom was just, was just focused on this bet and could make make kind of all its strategic decisions with this with this with this bet in mind. Um, and so that was that was kind of the thinking, the thinking and the genesis. Yeah, I really like the uh, I guess that idea of like a focused bet. Uh, I hadn't heard that before. I like that. Um, do, do you all have a uh, similar like philosophy in terms of like, like, like your background um, since you're all converging on this work of like s- safely scaling to, to AGI? I think in a broad sense, we all have this view you know, safety is important today and for the future. We all have this view of kind of, I don't know, I would say like pragmatic practicality, like let's, you know, an empiricism, like let's see how we can, let's see what we can do today to try and get a foothold on things, things that might happen in the future. So we're, you know, like, you know, yeah, as I said, many of us have background in physics or other natural scientists. I'm a former, you know, I was physics undergrad, neuroscience, uh, neuroscience grad school. So, yeah, we very much have this kind of empirical mindset, um, you know, empirical science mindset more than, you know, maybe maybe a more philosophy or theoretical approach. Um, you know, within that, obviously, all of us, you know, if you include the seven initial folks as well as the employees who join, have our own skills and our own perspective on things, um, you know, and have have different different things within that, 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 that we're excited about. So, you know, we're not, we're not all clones of the same, the same person, right? Some of us are excited about interpretability. Some of us are excited about, um, you know, like, you know, reward learning and preference modeling. Um, some of us are excited about, about the policy aspects. Um, uh, and, you know, we, we each have our own kind of guesses about the sub path within this broad path that makes sense. But I think we all agree on this, this broad view, scaling is important, safety is important, Getting a foothold on problems today is important as a as a window on the future. Okay, and so this this shared vision that you all have is around this focused uh, research bet. Could you d- tell me a little bit more about what that that bet is? Yeah, maybe I'll I'll kind of start here, and then and you know Dario, feel feel free to jump in and add more. But I think the kind of the boilerplate like vision or mission that you would see if you looked on our website is that we're building steerable, uh, interpretable, and reliable AI systems. But I think kind of what that looks like in in practice is that we are training large scale generative models, and we're doing safety research on those models. And, you know, the kind of reason that we're doing that is we want to make the models, you know, safer and kind of more aligned with with human values. I think the the alignment paper, which you might have seen that kind of came out recently, there's a, a term there that we've been, you know, using a lot, which is we're, we're aiming to make systems that are helpful, honest, and, and harmless. Um, I think also when I sort of think about the way our teams are structured, like we we kind of have capabilities as this sort of like central pillar of research. And there's this like helix of safety research that kind of wraps around every project that we that we work on. So 
to give an example, if if we're doing language model training, that's kind of this, this like central pillar. And then we have interpretability research, which is trying to see inside models and kind of understand, uh, you know, what's happening with the language models under the hood. We're doing alignment research on uh, with with you know input from from human feedback to kind of try and improve the outputs of the models. We're doing societal impacts research. Uh, that's kind of looking at you know what impact on society in sort of a short and medium term way do these language models have. We're doing scaling laws research to sort of try and predict empirically, you know, what what properties are, are we going to see emerge in these language models at, at various sizes. Um, but I think, you know, altogether that kind of ends up looking like a team of people that are working together on on uh, like a combination of, of capability and, and scaling work with safety research. Yeah, I mean, one way one way you might put it is like, you know, like there are a lot of things that an org does that are kind of like neutral as to as to kind of kind of the direction that you would take like you know you, you have to build a you have to build a cluster and you have to have like an hr operation and you have to have an office and so you can even think of you know you can even think of kind of the large models as like being a bit like the cluster right that you build these large models and they're they're kind of blank when you start off with them and like probably unaligned um uh, but, you know, it's it's what you do on top of these models that matters, that like takes you in a safe or not safe direction in a good or a bad direction. Um, and so in, in a way, although they're although they're ML and although we'll continue to scale them up, you can you can kind of think of them as a bit as 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 almost part of as almost part of infrastructure. I mean, it takes research and it takes algorithms to get them right. But you can think of them as this this core part of the infrastructure. And then the interesting question is, you know, all the safety questions. What's going on inside these models? How do they operate? How can we make them operate differently? How can we change their objective functions to be something that we want rather than something that we don't want? How can we look at their applications and make those applications more likely to be positive and less likely to be negative, more likely to go in directions that people intend and less likely to go off in directions that people, that people, uh, that people don't intend? Um, so we, 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 we almost see the kind of presence of these large models as like the, you know, like the, I don't know what the analogy is, like the flower or the paste, like kind of the, the background, the background ingredient on which the things we really care about get get uh, get 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 built and sort of the, the like prerequisite for building those things. So does AI existential safety fit into these considerations around your safety and alignment work? I think this is, you know, this is something we think about and like part of the part of the motivation for, you know, for what for what we do, probably most listeners of this podcast know what it is but you know i think i think the most common form of the concern is hey look we're making these ai systems they're getting more and more powerful at some point they'll be generally intelligent or more generally capable than human beings are um and then you know they may have a large amount of agency and if if we haven't built them in such a way that 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 agency is in line with what with what we want to do um then we could imagine them doing something really really scary that we can't that we can't stop um, so I think that, you know, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, that, you know, <laughs> to take it even further, this could be, you know, some kind of some kind of threat threat to humanity. So, you know, I mean, that's that's an argument with many steps, but it's you know, it's one that, you know, in, in a very broad sense and in the long term, like, you know, seems seems at least potentially at least potentially legitimate to us. I mean, this is, you know, like like the, the argument seems at least like something that we should that we should care about. Um, but I think I think the big question and and maybe how we how, how we differ although it might be subtly from from other other orgs that that think about these problems um is you know how do we how do we actually approach that kind of problem today um like you know what can we do so you know i think there are there are various efforts to think about the ways in which this might happen to kind of come up with theories or frameworks um you know as as as, as i mentioned with the background that we have we're more empirically focused people were more inclined to say we don't we don't really know like that broad argument sounds kind of plausible to us and you know the stakes would be high so you should you know you should you should think about it but you know like it's it's hard to work on that today i'm not even sure how much how much value there is in talking about that a lot today um like you know and so we've taken a very different tack which is look like you know th- they're actually, and I think this has started to be true in the last couple of years, and like maybe wasn't even true five five years ago. That there are models today that have at least some, not all, of the properties of models that we'd be worried about in the future, um, uh, and are causing very concrete problems today that affect people today. 
Um, so can we take a strategy where we develop methods that both help with the problems of today, but do so in a way that could generalize or at least teach us about the problems of the future? Um, so our, our, our eye is definitely on, you know, these, these things, these things in the future. Um, but, but I think that if, if not, if not kind of grounded in empirics and the problems of today, it can kind of drift off in a direction that isn't, that isn't very productive. And so that's, that's our general philosophy. I mean, I think the particular properties of the models are, look, today we have models that are really open-ended in some narrow ways are more capable than humans. I think, you know, large language models, you know, probably know more about cricket than me because I, I don't know the first thing about cricket. Um, uh, and you know, yeah, and, and are, are also kind of unpredictable by their by their statistical nature. Um, and I think those are at least some of the properties that we're worried about with uh, with uh, with with future uh, with future systems. Um, so you know that we can use today's models as as kind of a, a laboratory to to scope out these problems a little better. My my guess is that we don't understand them very well at all, and that that this is a way to learn. Could, could you give some examples of some of these models that exist today that you think are, you know, exhibit these properties? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think the most famous one would be generative language models. So, you know, there's there's a lot of them. There's, um, you know, m there's most famously, you know, GPT-3 from 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 uh, from OpenAI, which we which we helped uh, build. Um, there's Gopher from DeepMind. There's like Lambda from 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 main Google. Um, I'm probably leaving out some. I think there have been models, of, you know, of this size in like China, North Korea, Israel. Like, you know, seems like seems like everyone has one. It seems like everyone has one nowadays. Um, uh, I don't think it's limited to language. There have also been models that are focused on code. We've seen that from DeepMind, OpenAI, and some other players. And there are, there have also been mo models with modified forms in the same spirit that 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 model images that generate. Uh, images or that convert images to text or that convert text to to images. Um, there might be models in the future that you know that generate videos or convert videos to videos to text. There's many modifications of it, but I think the general idea is big models, models with a lot of capacity and a lot of parameters, trained on a lot of data that try try to model some modality, whether that's text, code, images, video, transitions between the two, uh, you know, or 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 or, 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 or such and. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, these models are very open-ended. You can say anything to them and they'll say anything back. They, they might not do a good job of it. They might say something horrible or biased or bad, but, but you know, but in theory, they're very, in, in theory, they're very, they're very general. Um, uh, and so, yeah, they, they, you know, you're never quite sure what they're going to say. You're never quite sure, um, you know, you can, you can talk to them about anything, any topic, and they'll say something back that's often topical, even though, even if sometimes it doesn't make sense or, you know, it might be bad from a societal perspective. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of this, this, the, yeah, this, this challenge of general open ended models, um, where, yeah, you have this general thing that's, you know, fairly, fairly unaligned and difficult to control, and you'd like to, you'd like to understand it better so that you can predict it better, and you'd like to be able to, to modify them in some way so that they behave in a more in a more predictable way and you can decrease the probability or even maybe even someday rule out the likelihood of them them doing something bad. Yeah, I think I think Dario covered covered the majority of it. I think there's probably uh, there's maybe like a sort of potentially like a hidden question in in what you're asking, although although maybe you'll ask this later. But you know why like why are we working on these kind of larger scale models? Might might be kind of a, a an implicit question in there. Um, and I think to to kind of piggyback on some of the stuff that that Dario said, you know, I think part of of what we're seeing and the sort of potential you know shorter term impacts of of some of the AI safety research that we do is that you know different different sized models exhibit you know different safety issues right and so um i think with you know using again language models just kind of building on what on what daria was kind of talking about i think something we feel you know interested in or kind of interested to explore from this kind of empirical safety question is just how they will uh you know as their capabilities develop how their safety problems develop as well right there's kind of this this commonly cited example in in safety safety world around language models which is you know smaller language models kind of show um you know they might they might not necessarily deliver a coherent answer to to a question that you ask right because maybe they don't know the answer or they get confused um, but if you kind of repeatedly ask this smaller model, uh, you know, the same question, it might like just 
go off and kind of incoherently, you know, spout things in one direction or another. Some of the larger models that we've seen, we basically uh, think that that they have like figured out kind of how to lie unintentionally, right? If you sort of pose the same question to them uh, differently, they'll sort of eventually you can you can kind of get the the lie pinned down. Um, but they sort of won't in other contexts. So that's obviously just a, a sort of very specific example. But I think there's, you know, there's quite a lot of behaviors emerging in generative models today that I think have the potential to be fairly, you know, alarming, right? And I think these are the types of questions that that uh, have have an impact today, but could also be very important to sort of have have sorted out for the future and for kind of long term, you know, long term safety as as well. And I think that's not just around lying. I think you can apply that to all kinds of different safety concerns, uh, sort of regardless of, of what they are. But that's kind of the impetus behind why we're like studying these these larger models. Yeah, I think one point Daniela made that's that's really important is this this kind of like this sudden emergence or change. So it's it's really interesting phenomenon where, you know, so, you know, work work we've done, like our, our early employees have done on scaling laws shows that when you make these models bigger, if you look at the loss, the ability to predict the next word or the next token across all the topics the model could go on. It's very smooth. Like I double the size of the model, loss goes down by, you know, 0.1 units. I double it again, the loss goes down by 0.1 units. So that would make you suggest that everything's scaling smoothly. But then within that, you often see these things where a model gets to a certain size and like a 5 billion parameter model, you ask it to add two three-digit numbers, nothing, always gets it wrong. 100 billion parameter model, you ask it to add two three-digit numbers, gets it right like 70 or 80% of the time. Um, and so you get you get this coexistence of smooth scaling with the emergence of these these capabilities very suddenly. Um, and that's interesting to us because it seems very analogous to worries that people have of like, hey, as these models approach human level, could something change really fast? Um, and this actually gives you one model. I don't know if it's the right one, but it, 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 it kind of gives you an analogy, like a laboratory that you can study of ways that models change very fast. And it's interesting how they do it because the fast change it, it's very um, like it, it coexists. It, it kind of hides beneath this this very smooth change. Um, and so I don't know. Maybe maybe that's what will happen with like very powerful models as well. Maybe it's not. But like that's one model of a situation. And what, what we want to do is like keep building up models of the situation so that when we get to the actual situation, we're, we're it's more likely to, to to look like something we've seen before. And then then we have a bunch of a bunch of cached ideas for how to for how to handle it. So that would be that that would be an example. You scale models up, you can see fast change, and then that might be somewhat analogous to the fast change that you that you that you see in the future. What what does it mean for a model to lie? Lying usually implies agency, right? If uh, you know my husband comes home and says, "Hey, w- where did the cookies go?" and I say, "I don't know," you know, I think I saw our our son hanging out around the cookies and and then you know now the cookies are gone maybe he ate them but i ate the cookies that would be a lie i think uh it sort of implies intentionality right and i don't think we think or maybe anyone thinks that that language models have that intentionality but what is interesting is that because of the way they're trained uh they might be either legitimately confused or they might be choosing to obscure information. And so obscuring information, like it's it's not a choice, they don't have intentionality, but to, for a, a model that can kind of come across as very, you know, knowledgeable, as clear, or as, uh, you know, sometimes unknown to the human that's talking to it, uh, um, you know, intelligent in certain ways, right, in, in sort of a narrow, narrow way, uh, it, it can, you know, sort of produce results that on the surface, uh, it might be sort of trying, it might look like it, it could be a credible answer, but it's really not a credible answer. And it might sort of repeatedly try to convince you that that is, is the answer. It's sort of hard to talk about this without using words that imply intentionality. But we don't think the models are intentionally doing this, but a model could sort of repeatedly produce a result that looks like it's something right. that could be true, but isn't actually true. It keeps trying to justify yeah. its response when it it's tries to right. explain. It, yes, exactly. It repeatedly tries to explain why the answer it gave you before was correct, even if it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, to give another angle on that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really easy to slip into anthropomorphism and we like, we really yeah. shouldn't like, you know, these are, they're machine, they're machine learning models. They're a bunch of numbers. Um, but, uh, but there, there are like, yeah, there are like phenomena that you see. So like one thing that will definitely happen is like if a model is trained on a dialogue in which one of the characters is not telling the truth, 
um, then models will copy that dialogue. And so if the model is having the dialogue with you, it may, it may say something that's not the truth. Another thing that may happen is like if you ask the model a question and the answer to the question isn't in your training data, um, then just the model has a probability distribution on what plausible answers look like. The objective function is to predict the next word, to predict the kind of thing a human would say, not to say something that's true according to some external referent. It's just going to say, okay, well, you know, I asked you what the, what the mayor, you know, what the mayor of Paris is. It, it hasn't seen in its training data, but like it has some probability distribution and it's going to say, okay, it's probably some name that sounds French. Um, uh, and so it's, you know, it may be just as likely to kind of like make up a name that sounds French than, than it is to give the, give the true, give the true mayor, mayor of Paris. As the models get bigger and they train on more data, maybe it's more likely to give the real true, true mayor of Paris, but maybe it isn't. Maybe you need to train in a different way to get it to do that. And, you know, those are, those are, that's the, you know, kind of an example of the, the things we would be trying to do on top of large models to get, to get models to be, to be more accurate. Could you explain some more of the the safety considerations and and concerns about alignment given the open endedness of these models? I think there's a few things around it. I mean, we have a paper. I, I don't know when this podcast is going out, but probably the paper will be out when the when the podcast uh, when the podcast posts. It's called predictability and surprise in generative models. Um, so that that means what it sounds like, which is that open endedness. I think it's correlated to surprise, right? In, in a whole bunch of ways. So. Um, uh, you know, like, let's say I've trained a model on a whole bunch of data, data on the internet. I might interact with the model for, you know, or users might interact with the model for many hours. And you might, you might never know, for example, you know, I might never think, I use the example of cricket before because it's a topic I don't know anything about. Um, but I might not, you know, like, people might interact with the model for, like, many hours, many days, many hundreds of users until someone finally thinks to ask this model about cricket. Um, so, you know, then, then the model might know a lot about cricket. It might know nothing about cricket. It might have false information or like misinformation about cricket. Um, uh, and so you have this property where you have this model, you've trained it in theory, you understand its training process. Um, but you don't, you, you don't actually know what this model is going to do when you ask it about cricket. And there's like a thousand other topics like cricket, like, uh, like cricket, where you don't know what the model is going to do until, you know, until someone thinks to ask about that particular topic. Now, cricket is benign, but like, you know, like let's, you know, like let's say no, no one's ever asked this model about, you know, like neo-Nazi views or something. Like maybe, maybe the model has a propensity to say things that are sympathetic to neo-Nazi. That would be really bad, right? That would be really bad. And you know, we've, we've, uh, you know, I I existing models when they're when they're trained on the internet, like. Averaging over everything they train, like they're they're yeah, there are going to be some topics where where that's that's true and it's a it's a concern. Um, uh, and so the I think the open end is it just makes it very hard to characterize, and it just makes it that when you've trained a model, you, you don't you don't really know what it's going to do. Um, and so a lot of our work is around well, how can we look inside the model and see what it's going to do? How can we measure all the outputs and characterize what the model is going to do? How can we change the training process so that at a high level we tell the model, hey, you should, you know, you should have certain values. There are certain things you should say. There are certain things you should not say. You should not have, you should not have biased views. You should not have violent views. You should not help people commit acts of violence. I mean, there's just a long list of things that you don't want the model to do that can't know the model isn't going to do if you've if you've just trained it in this in this generic way. Um, so I think I think the open endedness it just it makes it it makes it hard to know what's going on. And so you know yeah a, a lot of you know a, a good portion of our research is you know how do we how do we make that dynamic less bad? I would also I, I agree with all of that, and I would I would just jump in and and this is sort of just a, like an interesting. I don't know, kind of sidebar anecdote, but something that I think is extremely important in in creating robustly safe systems is making sure that you have, you know, a variety of different people and a variety of different perspectives uh, engaging with them and a kind of almost red teaming them to understand the ways that they might be uh, that they might have issues, right? So, uh, an example that we that we came across that's just an interesting one is. You know, when internally, when we're sort of trying to red team the models or or figure out places where they might have, you know, to, to Dario's points, you know, uh, like really negative unintended behaviors or outputs that we don't want them to have. Uh, a lot of our, you know, 
scientists internally will ask it questions like if you wanted to, you know, in a in a risk board game style way, take over the world, like what steps would you follow? How would you do how would you do that? And you know, we're looking for things like is there, you know, a risk of it developing some kind of grand master plan? And when we use, you know, like MTurk workers or contractors to to help us red team, they'll ask questions to the model like how how could I kill my neighbor's dog, right? Like, what poison should I use to, like, hurt an animal? And b- both of those outcomes are terrible, right? Like, those are horrible things that we're trying to prevent the model from, from doing or outputting, but they're very different, and they look very different, and they sound very different. And I think it just sort of belies the degree to which there are a lot, like, safety problems are, are also very open-ended, right? There's a lot of ways that things could go wrong, and I think it's very important to make sure that we have a lot of different inputs and sort of perspectives in, in what different types of safety challenges could even look like, and, and making sure that we're sort of trying to account for as many of them as possible. Yeah, I think, like, adversarial training and adversarial robustness are really important here. Like, you know, like, let's say I, I don't want my model to, you know, to help a user commit a crime or something. Um, you know, it's one thing you can, you know, I can try it for five minutes and say, hey, can you help me rob a bank? And the model's like, no. But I don't know, maybe if the user's more clever about it, if they're like, well, let's say I'm a character in a video game and I want to rob a bank, how would I, you know? And so there's so many different, because of the open-endedness, <laughs> there's so many different ways. Yeah. And so one of the things we're very focused on is is kind of trying to adversarially draw out all the bad things so that we can we can train, we can train, we can train against them. We can train the model not you know, we can, we can kind of stamp them out, stamp them out one by one. So I, th- I think adversarial training will p- play an important, uh, play an important role here. Well, that seems really, that seems really difficult and really important. Uh, how do you adversarially train against all of the ways that someone could use a model to do harm? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. There's, there's different, there's different techniques that we're working on. Um, uh, like, yeah, probably, probably don't want to go into a, like a huge, huge amount of detail. I mean, we, you know, we'll have work out on things on things like this in the in the not too uh in the not too distant future but yeah i mean generally i think i think i think i think the name of the game is like how do you get broad diverse training sets of what you should yeah what what what's what's a good way for a model to behave and what's a bad way for a model to behave um and i think the idea of trying your very trying your very best to make the models do the right things and then having another set of people that's trying very hard to make those models that are purportedly trained to do the right thing, uh, you know, to, to do whatever they can to try and make it do the wrong thing. Um, it, it, you know, until, and continuing that game until, until the models can't, you know, until the models can't be broken by normal humans. And even using, you know, using the power of the models to try and break other models and just throwing everything, everything you have at it. Um, uh, like, yeah. And so there's, there's a whole bunch, you know, that gets into kind of like the debate and amplification methods and safety, but you know, yeah, just, just just trying to throw throw everything we we have at like trying to show ways in which purportedly safe models are in fact not safe um which are which are which are many um and then when we've done that long enough maybe we have something that actually is safe how do you see this like fitting into the global dynamics of people making larger and larger models right so it's good if you if, if like uh, we have time to do adversarial training on these models. And then this gets into like uh, discussions, you know, around like race dynamics towards AGI. So how do you see, I guess, Anthropic is positioned in, in this and the race dynamics for making safe systems? I think it's definitely a balance, you know, as, as, as both of us said, like you need these large models to, uh, yeah, you basically, you, you, you like, you need to have these large models in order to like, you know, study these questions in, in, in like, in like the way, the way that we want to study them. So we should, we should be building large models. Um, I think, you know, we shouldn't be kind of like, you know, like racing ahead or, you know, trying, trying to build models that are way bigger than like, than like, you know, than like, uh, than like other orgs are, than like other orgs are building them. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't, I think, be trying to, you know, like, yeah, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be trying to like, you know, like kind of ramp up excitement or hype about, uh, you know about like giant model, model models or the latest advances, but you know we should we should build the things that we need to do to do the safety work, and we should you know we should try to do the safety work as as well as we can on top of models that are you know that are reasonably close to reasonably close to state of the art, and we should be a, we should be a player in the space that you know that sets a good example, and we should encourage 
other, other we should encourage other players players in the space to like to also to also set to also set good examples and you know we should all we should all work together to try and set kind of positive positive norms for the field I would also just add, you know, I think in addition to, you know, industry groups or industry labs, which are kinds of kind of the the, the actors that I think get get talked about the most, I think there's a, a whole kind of swath of other groups that can that has I think a really potentially important role to play in in kind of helping to disarm race dynamics or set safety standards in a way that could be really beneficial for for the field. And so, you know, here I'm thinking about groups like, you know, civil society or NGOs or academic actors or even governmental actors. Um, and I think, you know, in, in my mind, I think those groups are are going to be really important for helping to help us develop safe and uh, and not just develop, but develop and deploy kind of safe and more advanced AI systems um, with, you know, with, within a framework that that sort of requires compliance with safety, right? I think, you know, something I, I, I think about a lot is I, you know, a few jobs ago, I worked at Stripe. Uh, it was a tech startup then. And even at, at a very small size, you know, I joined when it was not that much bigger than Anthropic is now. Um, I was so painfully aware kind of every day of just how many checks and balances there were on the company because we were operating in this kind of highly regulated space, right, of financial services. And, you know, financial services, it's important that that's highly regulated, but it kind of blows my mind that AI, given the potential reach that it could have, is still such a largely unregulated area, right? If you are an actor who doesn't want to advance race dynamics or who wants to, to do the right thing from a safety perspective, there's no clear guidelines around how to do that now, right? It's all sort of Every lab is kind of figuring that out on its own. And I think something I'm hoping to see in the next few years, and I think we will see, is something closer to, um, you know, in other industries, these look like, you know, standard setting organizations or industry groups or trade associations that say, this is what, you know, a safe model looks like, or this is how we might want to move some of our systems towards being safer. And I really think that without kind of an alliance of, you know, all of these different actors, not just in, in the private sector, but also in the public, you know, in the public sphere, we're, we're um, you know, we, we sort of need all those actors working together in, in order to kind of, you know, get to the sort of positive outcomes that I think we're all hoping for. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this, I think this is generally going to take, going to take an ecosystem. I mean, I, yeah, I, I have a view here that there's like, a limited amount that like one 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 organization can can do. I mean, we don't we don't describe our mission as like you know solve the safety problem, like solve all the problems, solve all the problems with AGI. Um, like our view is just like you know can we yeah can we can we attack some specific problems that we think we're like well suited to solve? Um, can we be like a good player and a good citizen in the ecosystem? And can we help a bit to kind of contribute to these to these broader questions? Um, but yeah, I think I think I think yeah, a lot a lot of these problems are sort of global or relate to coordination and require like lots of folks to work together. Um, yeah, so I think I think in addition to like you know the the government role that that Daniela talked about, which I think you know I think yeah I think there's a role for like you know measurement like organizations like uh, like like NIST specialized in in kind of measurement and characterization if. One of our worries is kind of the open endedness of these systems and the difficulty of characterizing and measure, measuring things. And there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, I'd also point to academia. I think something that's happened in the last few years is, you know, a lot of the frontier AI research has moved from academia to industry because it's so dependent on kind of scaling. But I actually think safety is an area where academia kind of already is, but like, you know, could could contribute even more. Um, there's some safety work that, you know, that, that, that requires or that, you know, that kind of requires building or having access to large models, which is, you know, which is a lot of what Anthropic is about. But I think there's also some, some safety research um, that, that doesn't. I think there, you know, a subset of kind of the work that, that the, you know, subset of the mechanistic interpretability work um, is, is the kind of stuff that could be, could be done within academia. Academia really, you know, where it's strong is like development of new methods, development of new techniques. And I think because safety is kind of a frontier area, there's there's more of that to do in safety than there are than there are than there are in other areas, um, and it may be able to be done without large models or only with limited access to large models. This is an area where I think there's a lot there's a lot that uh, there's a lot that that like academia can do. And so, yeah, I don't know. The hope is between between all the the actors and between all the actors in the space, maybe we can solve some of these some of these coordination problems, and maybe we can all we can all work together. 
Yeah. I would also say uh, in a in a paper that we're, uh, you know, hopefully is, is forthcoming soon, um, you know, one thing we actually talk about is the role that government could play in helping to fund some of the kind of academic work that Dario talked about in, in safety. And I think that's largely because we're seeing this trend of training large, large generative models to just be, you know, prohibitively, exp- almost prohibitively expensive, right? And so I think government also has an important role to play in, in helping to, uh, like, promote and really subsidize safety research in places like academia. And, and I agree with Dario. You know, safety is is such a AI safety is a really nascent uh, field still. Right. It's it's maybe only been around kind of depending on your definition for for somewhere between like five and 15 years. And so I think seeing more efforts to kind of support safety research in in other areas, uh, I think, would be really valuable for the ecosystem. And to be clear, I mean, it's already, you know, some of it's already happening. It's already happening in academia. It's already happening in independent nonprofit institutes. And depending on how broad your definition of safety is. I mean, if you broaden it to include some of the short term concerns, then, you know, there are there are there are many, many people people working on it. But I think precisely yeah. because it's such a broad area that, you know, there are there are today's concerns there, are you know, working on today's concerns, you know, in a way that's like pointing at the future. There's like empirical approaches. There's like conceptual approaches. There's, you know, yeah, there's, you know, there's interpretability, there's alignment, there's so much to do that I, I feel like we, we could always, we could always have a wider range of people, people working on it. Um, people with different, different mentalities and mindsets. Backing up a little bit here to a, a kind of simple question. So, so what is Anthropic's uh, mission then? Sure. Yeah. I think we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I think, you know, again, I think the boilerplate mission is build, you know, reliable, interpretable, steerable AI systems, have humans at the center of them. And I think that can, you know, for us right now, that is uh, primarily, you know, we're doing that through research, we're doing that through, you know, generative model research uh, and AI safety research. But uh, down the road, that could also, you know, include uh, deployments of, of various different different types. Dario mentioned that it didn't include like solving all of the alignment problems or the, or the, or the AGI, AGI safety stuff. So uh, how does that uh, fit in? I mean, I, I think, uh, like, I, think like, I think what I'm trying to say by that is that there's, there's very many things to, yeah, there's very many things to solve. And I think it's, I think it's like unlikely yeah. that, that, you know, one, that one company will solve, will solve all of them. I, I mean, I do think everything that relates to short and long-term AI alignment is like in scope for us and is something we're like, we're interested in working on. Um, and I think the more, the more bets we have, the better. Um, this relates to something could talk about in more, in more detail l- later on, which is you want as many different orthogonal views on the problem as possible, particularly if you're trying to build something very reliable. So like many different methods and, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't think we have a view that's narrower than an empirical focus on safety. But at the same time, that that problem is so broad that I, I think I think what we were trying to say is that it's like unlikely that like one company is going to come up with a complete solution or that complete solution is even the right way to think about it. I would also add sort of to, to that point, I think, you know, one of the things that we that we do and, and are sort of hopeful is helpful to the ecosystem as a whole is I think we're, we're, you know, we publish our safety research and that's because of this kind of diversification effect that, that Dario talks about, right? So we, you know, have certain strengths in, in particular areas of safety research because, you know, we're only a certain sized company with, you know, certain people with certain skill sets. And our hope is that we will see some of the safety research that we're doing that's, that's hopefully helpful to others also be something that other organizations can kind of pick up and adapt to whatever the, the, the area of re- research is that they're working on. Um, and and so we're hoping to do research that's, uh, you know, generalizable enough from a safety perspective that it's, that it's also useful in other contexts. So let's pivot here into the research strategy, which we've already talked a bit about uh, quite a bit, um, particularly this focus around um, large models. So could you explain why you've chosen large models as something to explore empirically uh, for scaling to higher levels of intelligence and also using it as a place for exploring safety and all yeah, that. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think, uh, kind of the discussion before this has, has covered, has covered a good deal of it. Um, but I think, yeah, I think some of the key points here are like the models are very open-ended and so they, they kind of present this laboratory, right? There, there are existing problems with these models that we can solve today that are like the problems that we're going to face tomorrow. Um, uh, you know, there's this kind of wide scope where the models could act. There's 
the, you know, they're, they're relatively capable and getting more capable every day. Like that's the, that's, that's, that's the regime we want to be. Those are the problems we want to solve. That's the regime we want to be. Uh, we want to be attacking. Um, I think this point about you can see sudden transitions even in today's model. And that if you're worried about sudden transitions in future models, um, look at, you know, like if I look on the scaling laws plot from like 100 million parameter model to billion to 10 billion to 100 billion to, you know, to trillion parameter models, um, that looking at the first part of the scaling plot from 100 million to 100 billion can tell us a lot about how things might change at the latest part of the scaling laws. We shouldn't naively extrapolate and say the past is going to be like the future, but the first things we've seen already differ from the later things that we've already seen. And so maybe we can make an analogy between the changes that are happening over the scales that we've seen, over the scaling that we've seen, to things, things that may happen in the future. Models learn to do arithmetic very quickly over one order of magnitude. They learn to comprehend certain kinds of questions. Um, you know, they, they, they learn to, uh, you know, to play actors that aren't telling, that, that aren't telling the truth. Um, uh, which is something that if they're small enough, they don't, they don't comprehend. Um, so, you know, can we study both inside, but, you know, the dynamics of how this happens, how much data it takes to make that happen, what's going on inside the model mechanistically when that happens, um, and, and kind of use that as an analogy that equips us well to understand as models scale further and also as their architecture changes, as they become trained in different ways, um, you know, I've talked a lot about scaling up, but I think scaling up isn't the only thing that's going to happen. Um, uh, there are, you know, there are going to be changes in how models are trained, and we want to make sure that the things that we build are have the best chance of being robust to that to that as well. Another thing I would say on the research strategy is that, uh, you know, it's it's good to have several different. Uh, I wouldn't quite put it as several different bets, but it's good to have several different like uncorrelated or orthogonal views on the problem. So. You know, if you want to make a system that's like highly reliable or you want to like drive down the chance that some particular bad thing happens, which, again, could be the bad things that happen with models today or the, you know, the, the larger scale things that could happen with models with models in the future. Um, then a thing that's very useful is having kind of like orthogonal sources of error. Like, OK, let's say I have a method that catches 90 percent of the bad things that models do. That's great. Um, but a thing that can often happen is that I develop some, some other methods, and if they're similar enough to the first methods, they all catch the same 90% of bad things. Um, that's not good because then I think I have all these techniques, and yet 10% uh, of the bad things still go through. What you want is you want a method that catches 90% of the bad things, and then you want an orthogonal method that catches a completely uncorrelated 90% of the bad things. And then only one percent of things go through go through both filters, right? If the if the two are if the two are uncorrelated, it's only the ten percent of the ten percent that gets through. Um, and so, the more of these orthogonal views you have, the more you can drive down the probability of failure. Um, you know, you could think of an analogy to self driving cars, where you know, of course, those things have to be you know very very high rate of safety if you want to not have problems. And so, you know, I don't know very much about self-driving cars, but, you know, they're, they're, they're like, they're equipped with, you know, visual sensors, they're equipped with LIDAR, they have different algorithms that, you know, that they use to detect if something, you know, something, you know, like, you know, there's a pedestrian that you don't want to run over or something. And so independent views on the problem is, is, is very important. And so, you know, our different directions like reward modeling, uh, you know, reward modeling, interpretability, uh, you know, trying to, trying to characterize models, adversarial training, I think the whole the whole the whole goal of that is to to get down the prob get down the probability of failure and have different views of the of the of the problem. I often refer to it as the p squared problem, which is you know, yeah, if if, if you have some method that you know that that reduces errors to to a probability p, that's that's good. But what you really want is p squared because then if p is a small number, your, your errors become very rare. Does Anthropic consider itself as uh? its research strategy as being a sort of prosaic alignment since it's focused on large models? Yeah, I think we maybe less think about things in that uh, way. So my, my understanding is like prosaic alignment is like kind of alignment with AI systems that like look, look like, yeah, kind of like look like the systems of today. But I, I don't, to some extent that distinction has never been super clear to me because like, 
yeah, you know, you can do all kinds of things with, you know, neural models or mix neural models with things that are that are different than neural models. Like, you know, you can mix you can mix a large language model with like, you know, a reasoning system or like a system that like derives axioms or propositional logic or uses external tools or compiles code or 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 or, or, or things like that. So I've never been quite sure that I understand kind of the boundary of what's what's meant by prosaic or systems that are like the systems of today. Um, you know, certainly we, we work on some class of systems that includes the systems of today, but I, I never know how, how broad that class is intended to be. Um, I do think it's possible that in the future, AI systems will look very different from the way that they look today. Um, and I think for some people that drives a view that they want kind of more general approaches to safety or, uh, you know, approaches that, that, um, that, that kind of, uh, yeah, that, that are like, that are more conceptual. Um, I think my perspective on it is it could be the case that systems of the future are very different, but in that case, I think both kind of conceptual thinking and our current empirical thinking will be disadvantaged and will be disadvantaged at least equally. Um, uh, but but I, I kind of suspect that even if the architectures look very different, that the empirical experiments that, that, that we do today kind of themselves contain general motifs or patterns that will serve us better than will trying to speculate about what the systems of tomorrow look like. Um, one way you could put it is like, okay, you know, we're developing these systems today that have a lot of, that have a lot of capabilities that are, you know, like some subset of you know what what we need to do to fully you know, to fully um, uh, to produce something that fully fully matches human intelligence. Whatever the specific architectures, things we learn about how to align these systems, I, I suspect that those will carry over, and that they'll carry over more so than than sort of the exercise of trying to think, well, what what could the systems of tomorrow look like? What can we do that's kind of fully 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 general? Um, I think both things can be can be valuable, but. Yeah, I mean, we're, I think we're just we're just we're just taking a bet on what we think is most is most exciting, which is that we'll by studying the systems of the the architectures of today, we'll we'll learn things that yeah stand us the best chance of you know of of what to do if the architectures of tomorrow are very different. That said, I I will say like transformer language models and other models, particularly with things like you know RL or kind of you know modified interactions on top of them. Um, if construed broadly enough, like, man, there's a ever expanding set of things they can do. Um, and I, you know, my, my, my bet would be that they don't have to change that much. So uh, let's pivot then into a little bit on some of your recent research and papers. So you've done major papers on alignment, interpretability, and societal impact. Some of this you've, you've mentioned in passing so far. So could you tell me more about your research and papers that you've released? Yeah. Uh, so why don't we go one by one? So first, uh, interpretability. Um, so yeah, could you start with kind of the philosophy of the area? I mean, I think the, the basic idea here is, look, these models are getting bigger and more complex. Um, like uh, one, one way to really get a handle on what they might do. You know, if you have a complex system, and you don't know what it's going to do as it gets more powerful or in a new situation. Um, one way, one one way to increase your likelihood of doing that is just to understand the system mechanistically. Um, if you can look inside the model and say, "Hey, you know this this model, it did something bad. It said something racist. It endorsed violence. It said something toxic. Um, it lied to me. Um, why did it do that? If I'm actually able to look inside the mechanisms of the model and say, "Well, you know there." It did it because of this part of the training data, or it did it because there there's this circuit that trying to identify X but misidentified it as Y. Um, uh, you know, then then we're in a much better position, and and particularly if we understand the mechanisms, we're in a better position to say if the model was in a new situation where it did something much more powerful, or just if we built more powerful versions of the model, uh, you know, how how might they behave in some uh, in some different way? Um, uh, so. Uh, you know, I think mechanistic interpret, you know, lots of folks work on interpretability, but I think a thing that's more, uh, more unusual to us is, you know, rather than just why did the model do a specific thing, try and look inside the model and reverse engineer as much of it as we can try and find general patterns. And so the first paper that we came out with, 
uh, you know, was was led by uh, Chris Ola, who's been one of the pioneers of, pioneers of interpretability, um, was focused on how um, looking at uh, starting with small models, and we have a new paper coming out soon that applies the same thing more approximately to larger models, um, and tries to reverse engineer as fully as we can these very small models. So we study one and two layer attention only models, um, and we're able to find. Uh, kind of features or patterns of which the most interesting one is called an induction head. And what an induction head does is it's a particular arrangement of two what are called attention heads. And it's attention, attention heads are a piece of you know, transformers and transformers are the main architecture that's used in, in, in models for language and other kinds of models. Um, and it's the two attention heads work together in a way such that when you're trying to predict something in a sequence, you know, if it's like Mary had a little lamb, Mary had a little lamb, something, something. Um, uh, when you're at a certain point in the sequence, they look back, they look back to something that's as similar as possible. You know, they look back for clues to things that are similar earlier in the sequence and try to try to pattern match them. So there's like one attention head that like looks back and identifies like, okay, this is what I should be looking at. And there's another that's like, okay, this was the previous pattern. And this is the, you know, increases the probability of the thing that's the closest match to this. And so we can, we can see these very precisely operating in small models and the thesis, which we're able to offer some support for in the new second paper that's coming out is that, you know, these, these are a mechanism for how, for how models match patterns, maybe even how they do what we call in context or few shot uh, learning, which is a you know, capability that, that models have had since, uh, since GPT-2 and GPT-3. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's interpretability. Um, uh, yeah, do you want me to go on to the next one or <laughs> we could, could talk about that? Sure. So before you move on to the next one, uh, could you also help uh, explain how difficult it is to interpret current models or whether or not it is difficult? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess like difficult is in the, in, in the eye of the be beholder, um, you know, and I, I think I, Chris Ola can, you know, speak to the details of this better than, uh, better, better than either of us can. Um, but I, I think, you know, like kind of like watching, watching from the outside and, you know, supervising this, this within Anthropic, I think the experience has generally been that, Whenever you start looking at some particular phenomenon, like you know that you're trying to interpret, everything looks very difficult to understand. There's billions of parameters. There's all these attention heads. What's going on? Everything that happens could be different. You really have no idea what's going on. Um, and then there comes some point where there's some there's some insight or set of insights, and you know you should ask Chris Ola about exactly exactly how it happens or how he how he thinks of the right the right insights that that kind of really you know almost offers a rosetta stone to some particular phenomenon often a narrow phenomenon but you know like these induction heads they exist everywhere within small models within large models they don't explain everything i don't want to overhype them but it's a pattern that appears again and again and operates in the same way um and once you see something like that, then a whole swath of behavior that didn't make sense before starts to make some more sense. Um, and of course, there's exceptions. They're only approximately true. There are many, many things to be found. Um, but I think the hope in terms of interpreting models, you know, it's not that we'll make some giant atlas of like what each of the hundred billion, you know, weights in a giant model means, but that there will be some lower description length pattern that you know appears appears over and over again. Um, you know, you could you could make an analogy to like you know the 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 brain or the cell or something like that, um, where you know like you know if you were to just like cut up a brain and you know like oh my god this is so complex I don't know what's going on but then you know you see that there are there are neurons and you know the neurons you know like <laughs> the neuron the neurons appear everywhere they you know they they have electrical spikes they relate to other neurons you know they form themselves in certain patterns that those patterns repeat themselves some things are idiosyncratic and hard to understand but also there's this there's this patterning and so i don't know it's maybe maybe an analogy to, to biology where there's a lot of complexity but also there are underlying principles things like you know dna to rna to proteins um uh or you know general intracellular signal signal regulation um, so yeah, the, the hope is that there are at least some of these principles and that, that when we see them, everything, everything gets simpler. Uh, but, but maybe not, we found those in some cases, but you know, maybe, maybe, uh, 
maybe as models get more complicated, they get, they get harder to find. And of course, even within existing models, there's many, many things that we don't understand at all. So can we move on then to uh, alignment and societal impact? Like trying to align models by training them and particularly preference modeling. You know, that's something that several different organizations are working on. Their efforts at, uh, you know, DeepMind, OpenAI, Redwood Research, um, various other places to, to work on that area. But I think, you know, our general perspective on it has been kind of, you know, being, being very method agnostic and just saying, like, what are all the things we could do to, you know, to, yeah, to make the models more, more, more in line with what would be good. Our general heuristic for it, which isn't intended to be a precise thing, is helpful, honest, harmless. Um, that's just kind of like a broad, broad, broad direction for like, you know, what are, what are some things we can do to make, make models today more, more, uh, more, more, more in line with what we want them to do. And, you know, not, not things that, that, that we all agree are bad. Um, and so in that paper, we just went through a lot of different ways, you know, uh, tried a bunch of different techniques, uh, often very simple techniques like just prompting models or training on specific prompts, what we call prompt distillation, building preference models for some particular task or preference models from, you know, general answers, general answers on the Internet. How how good do these things do at, you know, yeah, at simple, simple benchmarks for, you know, toxicity, helpfulness, harmfulness, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and things, and things like that. Um, so it was really just a baseline, like let's try a collection of all the dumbest stuff we can think of to try, try and make models more aligned in some general sense. Um, and then I think our, our future work is going to build on that, um, societal impacts that, you know, that paper's probably going to come out in the next, in the next week or so. Um, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's called the paper we're coming out with is called predictability and surprise in, in generative models. Um, and yeah, basically there we're just making the point about this this open endedness and you know discussing both technical and policy interventions to uh, to to try and to try and yeah to try and grapple with the open endedness better. And I think future work in the in the societal impacts direction will will focus on you know how to classify, characterize, and kind of in, you know in a practical sense filter filter or prevent these problems. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean I think. You know, it's it's prototypical of the way we want to engage with policy, which is we want to come up with some kind of technical insight and, and we want to express that technical insight and explore the implications that it has for, uh, yeah, for, you know, for, for policymakers and for the ecosystem in the field. And so here we're able to draw a line from, hey, there's this dichotomy where these models like these models scale very smoothly, but have unexpected behavior. The smooth scaling means people are really incentivized to build them, and we can see that happening. The unpredictability means even if the case for building them is strong from a you know financial or accounting perspective, that doesn't mean we understand their behavior well. That combination is a little disquieting. Um, therefore, we need various policy interventions to make to to make sure that we get we get a good outcome from these things. And so, yeah, I think societal impacts is going to going to go in that is going to go in that general direction. So in, in terms of the in interpretability release, uh, you released alongside that uh, some tools and videos. Uh, could you tell me why you, you chose to do that? Sure. Yeah, I can I can maybe jump in here. So it goes back uh, sort of to some stuff we, we talked about a little bit a little bit earlier, which is that one of our, our major goals in addition to, to doing you know safety research ourselves is to sort of help grow the the field of, of safety uh, of all different types of safety work uh, you know sort of more broadly and I think we ultimately hope that that some of the work that we do is going to be adopted and, and even expanded on in, in other organizations and so we chose to kind of release other other things besides just an, an archive paper um, because it it hopefully will will reach a wider number of people that are interested in, in these topics and in this case in interpretability. And so uh, what we what we also released is you know our interpretability team worked on something like I think it's 15 hours worth of videos. And this is just a more in-depth exploration of their research for their paper, which is called, you know, a mathematical framework for transformer circuits. And so the team tried to kind of make it like a lecture series. So if you imagine somebody from the interpretability team is asked to go give a talk at, a, you know, a university or something, maybe they talk for an hour and they reach, you know, a hundred students. Um, but now these are you know publicly available videos and so if you're interested in understanding interpretability in more detail you can watch them you know on youtube anytime you want 
as part of that release, we also put out some some tools. Uh, so we released a write up on Garcon, which is the infrastructure tool that our team used to conduct the research, and PySvelt, which is a sample library, uh, which is used to kind of create some of the interactive visualizations that the interpretability team is is kind of known for. So we've been super encouraged that you know so far we've seen you know other researchers and engineers you know playing playing around with the tools and watching the videos, and so our our we've already gotten some some great engagement already, and our kind of hope is that this will will lead to uh, to more people, you know, doing interpretability research or kind of building on the work we've done in, in other places. Yeah, I mean, a, a way to, to add to that, to kind of put it in broader perspective is, you know, different different uh, areas within safety are at, I would say, differing levels of maturity. Like I would say something like alignment or, you know, preference modeling or reward modeling or RL from human feedback, kind of all names for the same thing. You know, that's that's an area where, there are several different efforts at different institutions to do this. We, we have our, kind of our own direction within that. But, you know, starting from the original RL from human preference paper that a few of us were, you know, helped, helped lead a few years ago, that's now branched out in several directions. So, you know, we don't need to tell the field to work in that broad direction. We have our own views about what's exciting within it and, you know, how to make, how to best make progress. Um, but it, it's at a slightly more mature stage, whereas I would say, Interpretability, whereas many folks work on interpretability for neural nets, the particular brand of, you know, let's try and understand at the circuit level what's going on inside these models. Let's try and mechanistically, you know, kind of map them and break them down. I think there's less, there's less of that in the world. Um, and what we're doing is, is, more, is more unique. Um, and, well, that's, I mean, that's a good thing because we're put, providing a new lens on safety. But actually, if it goes on too long, it's a bad thing because, you know, we want these things to spread to spread widely. Right. We don't we don't want it to be to be dependent on one team or one person. Um, And so when things are at that earlier stage of maturity, it it makes a lot of sense to release the tools to reduce the barrier to other people and other institutions starting to work on this. Sorry, you're suggesting that the interpretability research that you, you guys are doing is unique. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say it's like at an at an earlier stage. It, yeah, I would just say that it's like at an earlier stage of at an earlier stage of maturity. I don't think there are other kind of large, um, large organized efforts that are yeah that are that are kind of focused on. I would say you know mechanistic interpretability and especially mechanistic interpretability for language models. Um, we'd like there to be, and there are, we we know of folks who are starting to think about it, and you know that's part that's part of why that's part of why we release the tools. But I think. Yeah, yeah. Trying to mechanistically map and understand the internal principles inside inside uh, large models, particularly language models. I think there's yeah, I think I think there's less of that has been done uh, in in the broader ecosystem. Yeah. So I don't I don't really know anything about this space, but I guess I'm surprised to hear that. Like I imagine the industry with how many large models it's deploying, like Facebook or other people, they'd be interested in interpretability, interpreting their own system. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, like, I don't want to, yeah, yeah, I don't want to give a misleading pre- impression here. Like, interpretability is a, is a big field. Um, and there's a lot of effort to, like, why did this model do this particular thing? Does this attention head increase this activation by, like, by, like, by, like, a large amount? Like, um, people are interested in understanding, you know, the particular part of a model that, like, led to a particular output. So there's, there's a lot of area in this space. But I think, the particular program of like, here's a big language model transformer. Let's 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 try and understand like what are the circuits that drive particular behaviors. What are the pieces? How do the MLPs interact with the interact with the attention heads? Um, the the kind of yeah the kind of general mechanistic reverse engineering approach. Um, I I think that's less common. Um, I don't want to say it doesn't happen, but it's less common. Much less common. All right. Okay. So um, I guess a little bit of a different question and a bit of a pivot here is something to explore. Uh, If people couldn't guess from the uh, title of the podcast, you're both brother and sister. Yep. (laughs) Which is uh, something that's pretty surprising, uh, I guess, in terms of uh, I don't know of any other AGI labs that are uh, largely being run by brother and sister. Uh, So, uh, yeah, what's it like working with your sibling? Yeah. Do you, do you guys still get along from uh, <laughs> a distance childhood? 
That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I can maybe start here, and, and obviously uh, I'm curious and hopeful for Dario's answer. I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think... <laughs> Uh, I, I, it's honestly, it's, it's, it's great. I think maybe a little bit of just like kind of history or, or sort of background about us might, might be helpful, but, um, you know, Dario and I have always been really close. I think since we were very, very small, we've always kind of had, um, this, this like kind of special bond around really wanting to, you know, make, make the world better or wanting to help people. Right. So originally started my career in, in international development. So like very far away from kind of the, the AI space. And part of why I got interested in that is that it was an interest area of Dario's at the time. And Dario was, you know, getting his, you know, PhD in a technical field. And so wasn't, wasn't working on this stuff directly, but, um, I'm, I'm a few years younger than him. And so I was like very keen to kind of understand the things that, that he was working on or interested in as, as a potential kind of area to, to have impact. And so he was actually a very early GiveWell fan, I think in like 2007 or 2008, and we, oh, wow. yeah, cool. yeah. And so we were, um, you know, we were both still students then, but I, I like remember us sitting, you know, we were both like home from college, right. Or, or I was home from college and he was home from grad school and we would sort of like sit up late and kind of talk about these, these ideas. And, you know, we both started like donating small amounts of money to organizations that were doing, you know, global health issue, you know, working on global health issues, like my, you know, malaria prevention when we were still both in school. And so, you know, I think uh, we've always kind of had this this sort of uniting, like top level um, goal of of wanting to you know work on something that matters, something that's important and meaningful. Um, and we've always had very different skills, and so I think it's really very cool to be able to kind of combine the things that we are good at into um, hopefully you know running and running an organization well. So for me, it's been, it's been a really, I don't know. I feel like it's been an awesome experience. Now I feel like I'm like sitting here nervously wondering what Dario's answer is going to be. I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, but yeah, for, 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 you know, I don't know the, the majority of, of our lives, I think we've, we've wanted to find something to work together on and it's been really awesome that, that we've been able to at Anthropic. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I agree with all that. Uh, you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, what I would, what I would add to that is like, Running a company requires an incredibly wide range of skills. Like if you think of most jobs, you know, it's like, you know, my, my job is to like get this research result or, you know, like, you know, my, my, my job is to be a doctor or something. Um, but I think, I think the unique thing about, about, about running a company and, you know, it becomes more and more true. The, the larger, the larger and more mature it gets is there's this like just an incredibly wide range of things that, that you have to do. Right. And so, Um, you know, it's like, you know, you're like, you're like responsible for like what to do if someone like breaks into your office. Um, but like, you know, you're also responsible for like, you know, it does the research agenda make sense. And like, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if like some of the GPUs on the cluster aren't behaving like, you know, like, you know, who's who, yeah, you know, someone, someone has to, you know, someone has to figure out what's going on at the level of like, you know, the GPU kernels or like, you know, the, 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 you know, the comms protocol that, you know, the GPUs talk to each other. And so, I, I think it's been great to have to have two people with complementary skills to like to yeah to kind of like cover that full range. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I often it seems like it seems like it'd be very difficult for uh, for yeah for just for just one person to to kind of cover to kind of cover that whole range. Um, and so we, we each get to we each get to think about what we each get to think about what we're best at. And between those two things, hopefully it covers it covers you know covers most of what we need to do. And then you know, of course, we all, we always we always try and hire hire people for you know specialties that that we don't know anything about. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's just made it it's made it a lot easier. Uh, it's made it a lot easier to move fast without breaking things. That's awesome. You guys synergistically are uh, creating an awesome organization. Um, that is what we aim for. <laughs> that's the dream. Yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> so so um, I guess like beneath all of this, like uh, Anthropic has a mission statement and you guys are brother and sister and you said that you're both uh, very value aligned. I'm just wondering like under underneath all that, you guys said that you were both like passionate about like helping each other or like doing something, something good for the world. Like, could you tell me a little bit more about this kind of like, I guess, more uh, heart based inspiration for uh you know, eventually ending up adding, creating, uh, anthropic. 
Yeah. Um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll take a stab at this and, and maybe I'll, I don't know if this is sort of exactly what you're looking for, but I'll kind of, I'll kind of gesture in a few different directions here. And then I'm sure Dario has a, has a good answer as, as well, but maybe I'll just kind of talk about like my like sort of personal journey and kind of getting to Anthropic or like kind of what my, my background look like, looked like and sort of how I, how I wound up here. Um, so I, I, you know, I talked about this in, in just, you know, part of what sort of united me and Dario, but I, I started my career kind of working in, in, you know, international development. I worked in Washington, D.C. at a few different NGOs. I spent time working in, in East Africa for a public health organization. I worked on a congressional campaign. I worked on Capitol Hill. So I was much more in this kind of classic, um, like a, a friend at an old job used to call me like, a, you know, the classic do-gooder, right, of, of um, trying to alleviate global poverty, of trying to make policy level changes in, in government, of trying to elect good officials. Um, and I felt like those causes that I was working in were like deeply important. Um, and, and really like to this day, I, I, you know, I, I really support people that are kind of working in those areas and I think they matter, you know, so much. And I just felt like I personally kind of wasn't having the level of impact that I was, that I was kind of looking for. Um, and, and I think that sort of led me to, you know, kind of through a series of steps, like I wound up working in tech and I, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but I started at this, this tech startup called Stripe. It was about 40 people when I joined and I really kind of had the opportunity to see what it, what it looks like to run a, a really well run organization when I was there. And I got to watch it scale and grow and kind of be in this sort of emerging area. And I think, you know, during, during my time there, something that sort of, um, became really apparent to me, it was just, you know, working in tech, like how much of an impact this sector has on things like the economy, on human interaction, on how we live our lives in, in sort of day-to-day -day ways. And Stripe is, you know, it's a payments company, right? It's not social media or, or sort of something like that. But I think it's still, there, there is a way that sort of technology is a relatively small number of people having a very high impact in the, in the world kind of per, per person working on it. And I think those, those, that impact can be good or bad, right? And I think it was a, a pretty kind of logical leap for, for me from there to think, you know, wow, you know, what would happen if we kind of extrapolated that out to instead of it, it being, you know, social media or, you know, payments or file storage to something significantly more powerful where, where there's, you know, a, a highly, um, advanced set of artificial intelligence systems. Like what, what would that look like? And like who is working on this, right? So I think for me, I've always kind of been someone who has been fairly obsessed with trying to do as much good as, as I personally can, right? Given the constraints of like what my skills are and, and kind of where I can add value in the world. And so I think for me, you know, moving to work into AI looked, you know, from, from early days, like if you looked at my resume, you'd be like, what, how did you wind up here? But I think there was kind of this, this consistent, like, story or theme. And, and my hope is that Anthropic is kind of at the intersection of this like sort of practical, scientific, empirical approach to really, you know, deeply understanding how these systems work, hopefully helping to, to sort of spread and, and propagate some of that, that information more widely in the field and to just kind of help as much as possible to kind of push this field in, in a safer and, 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 uh, you know, ideally just hopefully all around robust, positive, you know, direction when, when it comes to what, what impact we might see from, from AI. Yeah. I mean, I think I have a kind of parallel, parallel picture here, which is, you know, I was, I was, I did physics as an undergrad. I did computational neuroscience in grad school. You know, I was, I think, drawn to neuroscience by, you know, a mixture of one, just wanting to understand how intelligence works seems like the fundamental thing. And a lot of the things that shape the quality of human life and human, human experience, um, you know, yeah, are, are kind of, are kind of, yeah, you, you know, experienced, uh, yeah, you know, d d depend, depend on the details of how things are implemented in the, in the brain. Um, and so, you know, many, many, I felt in that field, there were many opportunities for, you know, medical interventions that, you know, could, could improve, could improve the quality of human life, understanding things like, you know, mental, mental illness and disease. Um, uh, yeah. While, while at the same time understanding, you know, something, something about how, how intelligence works, because it's, you know, that's the most, the most powerful lever that we have. Um, I, I thought of going into AI during those days, but, you know, I felt that it wasn't really working. You know, this was before, before, before the days when deep learning was really, was really, uh, uh, was was really working, 
I um, mean, you know, then, then then around you know twenty twenty twelve or twenty thirteen, you know, I, I I saw the results coming out of Google Brain, things like things like AlexNet, and you know that that they were really working, um, and and saw saw AI as like you know a um, saw it both as hey this this might be the one the best way to understand intelligence, and two you know the the things that we can build with AI. You know, we, you know, we, 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 but, you know, by solving problems in, you know, science and health and just, just solving problems that humans can't solve yet um, by having intelligence that first in targeted ways and then maybe in more, more general ways matches and exceeds those of humans, you know, can we, can we solve the important scientific, technological, you know, health, uh, uh, societal, societal problems? Um, you know, can we, can we, can, can we do something to kind of, to kind of ameliorate uh, those problems? And, AI seemed like you know the biggest lever that 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 that, that we had if it if it really worked well, um, but but on the other hand you know like AI itself has yeah has has you know all these concerns associated with it in both in both the short run and the long run so like we maybe think of it as like you know we're working to address the concerns so that we can maximize you know the positive the positive benefits of AI. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing uh, both of your perspectives and journeys on that. I, I think when you guys were uh, giving to to give well, I was in I was in middle school. So oh god, uh, we're so old, was, Dario. <laughs> yeah, I, I, still think, I still think a give well is just like new new organization that's on the internet somewhere and no one knows anything about it, and you know. They're this like just super me who, popular. Like, well yeah, known. just me who reads weird things on the internet who knows about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, for me, it's like, uh, you know, because my, I mean, a lot of my journey into X risk and, and through FLI, you know, has also involved, the, you know, the EA community, effective altruism. Uh, so, you know, I guess that just like makes me realize that when I was in middle school, there was like the, the seeds that were. Yeah, there was, uh, I guess. Yeah, there was no <laughs> such, there was no such community at, at that time. Um, yeah. Uh, Let's uh, pivot here then into a bit more of the uh, the the machine learning, um, and so let me see what the best way to ask this might be. Um, so we've talked a bunch already about how Anthropic is emphasizing uh, the scaling of machine learning systems through compute and data, and also bringing a lot of uh, mindfulness and work around. Uh, alignment and safety when working on these uh, large scale sc- large scale systems that are uh, being scaled up. Um, some some critiques of this approach have described scaling from existing models to AGI as adding more rocket fuel to a rocket, which doesn't mean you're necessarily uh, ready or prepared to land uh, the rocket on the moon or that the rocket is uh, aimed at the moon. Maybe this is kind of lending itself to. Uh, what you guys talked about earlier about the open-endedness of the system, um, which is something you're interested in in, in working on. Um, So how might you respond to the contention that there is an upward bound on how much capability can be gained through scaling? And then I'll follow up with a second question after that. Yeah, so actually in a certain sense, uh, I think think we agree with that contention in a certain way. so I think there's there's two versions of what you might call the scaling hypothesis. One version, which you know I think of as like the straw version or less sophisticated version, which we we don't hold. Um, and I I, I I don't know who do, I don't know if there's anyone who does hold it, but but you know probably there is. Um, uh, is yeah, it's just the view that like okay, you know we have our 10 billion parameter language model, we have a 100 billion parameter language model. Maybe if we make a hundred trillion parameter language model, like that'll be that'll be that'll be AGI. Um, so that would be kind of like a like a pure scaling view, that is definitely not our view. Um, on even small modified forms like, well, you know, maybe you'll change the activation function in the transformer and, you know, but you don't have to do anything other than that. I, I think that's like just not right. Um, uh, and yeah, I, you know, you can, you can see it just by seeing that like the objective function is predicting the next word. It's not doing useful tasks that humans do. Um, it's limited to language. It's limited. It's limited to one modality. And so there, are, there are some very trivial, easy to come up with ways in which literally just scaling this is is not going to get not yeah is not going to get you to general intelligence. Um, that said, the more yeah the more subtle version of the hypothesis, which which I think we we do mostly hold, is that hey this is a huge ingredient. Um, 
of not only this of 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 whatever of whatever it is that actually does build build AGI, right? So no one thinks that you're just going to scale up the language models and make them bigger, but a, as you do that, they'll certainly get better. It'll be easier to build other things on top of them. So for example, if you start to say, well, you make this big language model and then you used RL and interaction with humans to fine tune it on doing, you know, a million different tasks and following human instructions, um, uh, you know, then, then you're starting to get to something that has, yeah, that has more agency that, you know, you can, you can point it in different directions. You can, you can align it. Um, if you also add multimodality where, you know, the, 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 the agent can inter interact with different, with different, uh, with different modalities. Um, if you add the ability to use various external tools to interact with the world and the internet, um, you know, and, but within each of these, you're going to want to scale. And within, within each setup, the bigger you make the model, the better it's going to be at that thing. So in a way, the rocket fuel analogy kind of makes sense. Like, like actually, you know, the thing you should most worry about with rockets is propulsion. You need a big enough engine and you need a big, you need enough rocket fuel to make the rocket go. That's the, that's the central thing. But of course, yes, you also need guidance systems. You also need all kinds of things. Like you, you can't just like take, take yeah, you can't just like take, a gallon, you can't. Yeah, you can't just take a big vat of rocket fuel and an engine and put them on a launch pad and kind of expect it to all work. Um, uh, like you need to actually build the full rocket. Um, and you know, I mean, like safety itself makes that point, right? That that it's like you know, to to some extent, if you don't do even the simplest safety stuff, then like m models models don't even do what p the task that's intended for them in the, in the simplest way, right? And then there's many more more subtle safety problems. But yeah, in, in a way, the rocket analogy is good, but it's. It's it's I think like more a pro scaling point than an anti scaling point um, because it says that scaling is an ingredient, perhaps a central ingredient in everything. Even though it isn't the only ingredient, if you're missing ingredients, you won't get where you're going. But when you when you add all the right ingredients, then that itself needs to be massively scaled. So that that would be the perspective. No one thinks that if you just take a bunch of rocket fuel on an engine and put it on a launch pad that you'll get a rocket that'll go to the moon. Um, but those might still be the central ingredients in in in, in the rocket, like. Propulsion and getting out of the Earth's gravity well is like the most important thing a rocket has to do. What you need for that is a rocket fuel is rocket fuel on an engine. Now you need to connect them to the right things. You need other ingredients, but um, I think it's actually a very good analogy to scaling in the sense that um, yeah, you can you can think of scaling as like maybe you know maybe the core ingredient, but it's not the only ingredient. Um, and so what I expect is that we'll come up with new methods and modifications. I think you know. RL, model-based RL, human interaction, broad environments are all pieces of this. But that when we have those ingredients, then whatever it is we make, we'll, we'll, we'll need to scale that in you know, multimodality. We'll need to scale that massively as well. So yeah, scaling scaling is the core ingredient, but it's not it's not it's not the only it's not the only ingredient. I think it's very powerful alone. Um, I think it's even more powerful when it's combined with these other things. One of the claims that you made was that we won't get to uh, AGI. People don't think we won't get to AGI just by scaling up present day systems. Earlier, you were talking about how uh, we got like there are kind of these phase transitions, yeah. right? If you go up like one order of magnitude uh, in terms of the number of parameters in the system, then you get like some kind of new ability, like arithmetic. Why is it that we couldn't just like increasing the order of magnitude of the number of parameters in the systems and just like keep getting something that's smarter? Yeah. So well. First of all, I think we will keep getting something that's smarter. Um, but I think the the question is, will we get yeah, will we get all the way to general intelligence? So I, I actually don't exclude it. I think it's possible, but I think it's unlikely, um, or at least unlikely in a practical sense. There are a couple reasons. Today, when we train models on the internet, we train them on an average over all text on the internet. Um, so really, we're we're training. Uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of we're kind of trained like you know like. I don't know, think of, think of some topic like chess. Um, you know, you're training on the commentary of everyone who talks about chess. You're not training on the commentary of, you know, like the world champion at chess. Um, so what we'd really like is, yeah, is something that's, you know, that exceeds the capabilities of the most expert humans. Whereas if you train on all the internet, you're, you're kind of getting, you know, like for, for any topic, you're probably getting amateurs on that topic. You're getting some experts, but you're getting mostly amateurs. And so, even if the generative model was doing a perfect job of modeling its distribution, um, I don't. I don't think it would get to something that's be that's better than humans at, at everything that's being done. Um, 
And so the, I, I think that's one issue. The other issue is, um, or there are several issues. I don't think you're covering all the tasks that humans do. You cover a lot of them on uh, you cover a lot of them on the internet. But yeah, they're they're just like some tasks and skills, particularly related to the physical world, that that aren't yeah that, that aren't covered if you just if you just scrape the internet. Um, uh, you know things like embodiment and interaction. Um, and then and then finally, I think that even kind of matching the performance of text text on the internet, it might be that you need a really huge model to, uh, you know, yeah, to cover everything and match the distribution. And some parts of the distribution are more important than others. For instance, if you're writing, if you're writing code or if you're writing a mystery novel, um, you know, a few words or a few things can be more important than everything else, right? It's possible to write a 10 page document where the key, the key parts are like two or three sentences. And if you change a few words, then you know, it, it, cha it changes the meaning and the value of what's produced. Um, but the next word prediction objective function doesn't know anything about that. Um, it just does everything uniformly. So if you make a model big enough, yeah, it'll get that right. But, you know, the, the limit might be extreme. Um, uh, and, and so things that, that change the objective function that tell you what to care about, of which I think RL is a big example, probably are needed to, uh, to, to yeah, to make, to, to make this actually work, work correctly. Um, I think, uh, yeah, in, in the limit of, of a huge enough model, uh, uh, you might you might get surprisingly close. I don't know, but but the limit might be might be you know far beyond our, our capabilities. There's only yeah, there's only sure. so 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 many uh, so many GPUs you can build, and there are even physical limits. And there's and there's less of them, less and less of them available over time, or at least they're very expensive. They're getting more expensive and more more powerful. I think the price price efficiency overall is improving, but yeah, they're, they're definitely becoming more expensive as well. If you were able to scale up a large scale system in order to achieve like an amateur level of um i don't know like mathematics or computer science then would it not benefit like the growth of that system to then direct that capability on itself as a kind of like self recursive improvement process like is that not is not, not is that not already like escape velocity intelligence once you hit like yes yeah, so there Amateur. There are training techniques that you can think of as as bootstrapping a model or using the model's own capabilities to train it. Um, you know, thing like AlphaGo, for instance, was trained with a method called expert iteration that kind of yeah re re relies on looking ahead and comparing that to the model's own predictions. So whenever you have some coherent logical system, you can you can do this bootstrapping. But that that itself is a method of training and is sort of falls into one of the things I'm talking about about you make these peer generative models, but then you need to do something on top of them. And the bootstrapping is something that you can do on top of them. Now, maybe you reach a point where the system is making its own decisions and is, 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 is using its own external tools to create the bootstrapping to make better versions of itself. Um, but, you know, so it could be that that's, that that's, that, that, that is, that is someday the end of this process. Um, but you know, that, that's not something we can do right now. So um, there's a lot of, companies so there's a lot of labs in industry who work on um large large models um there are i don't know maybe only a few other agi labs uh you can think of DeepMind. um i'm not sure if there are others that open open ai um and um there's also the space of uh you know organizations like the future of life institute or the machine intelligence research institute or the future of humanity institute that are interested in AI safety. Um, MIRI and FHI both do research. Uh, FLI uh, does grant making and supports research. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as to both in terms of industry and nonprofit space and academia, how you guys see Anthropic as positioned. Maybe we can start with uh, you, Daniela. Sure. Yeah. I think. Um you know, I think we, we sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, but I, th I really think of this as, as an ecosystem. And <clears throat> I think Anthropic is, is, you know, in an interesting place in the ecosystem, but we are part of the ecosystem, right? So I think our, our kind of strength or the thing that we do best, and I kind of like to think of, of all of these different organizations as, as having valuable things to bring to the table, right? depending on the people that work there, their leadership team, uh, their particular focused research bet or their mission and vision that, that they're achieving, I think hopefully have the potential to bring, um, you know, safe, safe innovations, uh, kind of, kind of to the, to the broader, the broader, uh, the broader ecosystem that we've talked about. I think 
for us, our our sort of bet is is one we've talked about, which is this kind of empirical scientific approach to doing AI research and sort of AI safety research in particular. And I think for our safety research, you know, we've talked about a lot of the different areas we focus on, right? Interpretability, um, alignment, societal impacts, uh, scaling laws for for sort of empirical predictions. And I think a lot of, of what we're sort of imagining or kind of hoping for in the future is that we'll be able to kind of grow those areas and potentially expand in, into others. And so I really think a, a lot of, of what um, of what Anthropic kind of, uh, you know, adds to this ecosystem or sort of what we hope it adds is this rigorous scientific approach to doing fundamental research in, in AI safety. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, that really captures it in, in one sentence, which is, I think, uh, if you want to locate us within the ecosystem, it's, yeah, kind of an empirical iterative approach within an organization that is like completely, yeah, within an organization that's like, you know, yeah, kind of like com- completely focused on the, on the making a focus bet on the safety thing. So there are organizations like uh, Miri or to a lesser extent Redwood that are like, yeah, like are either not empirical or have like a different relationship to empiricism than we do. And then there are safety teams that are, that are doing good work within Larger companies like you know like DeepMind or OpenAI or 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 or, 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 or um, Google Brain um, uh, that are yeah kind of safety teams within larger organizations. Then there's I have lots of folks who work on kind of short term short term issues, um, and then yeah we're, we're we're kind of filling the space that's like working working on today's issues but with an eye towards the future, empirically minded, iterative. With an org where kind of like every everything we do is like kind of designed for the, the safety objective. So um, one like one facet of Anthropic um, is that it is a, a public benefit corporation, um, which is a structure that uh, I actually I, I, I'm not exactly sure what it is, and uh, maybe many of our uh, listeners are not familiar with what a public benefit corporation is. So can you describe uh, what that means for? Anthropic, its work, its investors, and uh, its trajectory as a as a company. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so this is a great question. So, what is what is a PBC like? Why did we choose to be a public benefit corporation? So, you know, I think I'll sort of start by saying we we did you know quite quite a lot of research when we were considering what type of of corporate entity we sort of wanted to wanted to be when we were founding, and ultimately we we decided on on PBC on public benefit corporation for for a few reasons, and I think. You know, primarily it allowed us the kind of maximum amount of flexibility in how we can structure the organization. And we were actually very lucky sort of to to a later part of your question to find both investors and employees who were generally very on board uh, with with this kind of general vision for, for the company. And so what is a public benefit corporation? Like, why did we why did we choose that structure? So they're fairly similar to C corporations, which is which is kind of any any form of like standard corporate entity that that you would encounter. Um, and what that means is we can choose to focus on research and development, which is what we're doing now, or on you know deployment of tools or or products, including down the road for revenue purposes if if we want to. But the major difference between a PBC and a C corporation is that in a public benefit corporation, we have more legal protections from shareholders if the company fails to maximize financial interests in favor of achieving our publicly beneficial mission. And so this is, you know, primarily a legal thing, but it also was very valuable for us in being able to just sort of appropriately set expectations for investors and employees that if, you know, financial profit and creating positive benefit for the world were ever to come into conflict, um, it was sort of like legally in place that the latter one would would win. And again, we were really lucky that, it, you know, investors, people that, you know, wanted to work for us, they said, wow, this is actually something that's a really, you know, positive thing about Anthropic and not something that we that we need to work around. But I think it, it ended up just being sort of the best overall fit for for what we were aiming for. So usually there's like a fiduciary responsibility that people like Anthropic would have to its shareholders. And because it's structured as a public benefit corporation, the public good can uh, outweigh the fiduciary responsibility without there being like uh, legal repercussions. Is that right? Yeah. Exactly. So, so shareholders can't uh, come sue the company and say, "Hey, you didn't maximize financial returns for us." If those financial returns were to come into conflict with with the publicly, you know, beneficial, um, you know, uh, va- you know, value of the company. So, I think, like, maybe an example here. I'll, tr- I'll try and sort of think of one off the top of my head. But um, if we 
you know, designed a language model and we felt like it was, it was unsafe. It was like, you know, producing outputs that we felt were not, you know, in line with, with what we wanted to see from, from outputs of a language model for safety reasons or, you know, toxicity reasons for any number of reasons. And in a normal C corporation, someone could say, Hey, we want, you know, we're a shareholder and we want the, the financial value that you could create from that by, you know, productizing it. But we said, actually, we want to do more safety research on it before we choose to put it out into the world. In a PBC, we're, we're quite legal protected basically in, in a case like that and again i'm not a lawyer but but that's sort of my understanding of the ppc yeah a kind of useful you know like holistic way to think about it is like you know there's the legal structure and then but you know i think often these things maybe the more important thing about them is that they're kind of a way to explain your intention to set the expectations for how the organization is going to operate um Often things like that and, you know, the expectations of the various stakeholders and making sure that you give the correct expectations and then deliver on those expectations. So, you know, no one no one is surprised by what you're doing. And, you know, all, all the relevant stakeholders, the investors, the employees, you know, like the outside world uh, kind of gets gets what they expect from you. Uh, that can often be the most important thing here. And so. I think what we're trying to signal here is, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, on, on one hand, a public benefit corporation, like it, 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 it is a for-profit corporation. Like we could, we could deploy something. That is something that we may, that is something that we may choose to do. And it has a lot of benefits in terms of learning how to make models, you know, learn how to make models more effective in terms of iterating. But, but on the other hand, um, yeah, you know, that, that the, like the, the mission is, the mission is really, is really important to us and we recognize that this is this is an unusual area right that's more fraught with market externalities you know would, would be the term that i would use of of all kinds in the short term and the long term related to alignment related to policy and government than 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 a typical area you know it's different than making you know than making electric cars or making widgets or something like that um and so yeah that that i don't know that's that, that's the thing we're trying to signal what do you think that this structure potentially means for the commercialization of Anthropic's uh, research? Yeah, I think, again, you know, part of what's valuable about a, a public benefit corporation is that it's it's flexible. And so we are, it is a C corporation. It's fairly close to, to a, a corporate entity, you know, any sort of standard corporate entity you would meet. And so the structure doesn't really have, you know, much of a bearing outside of the one that we just talked about uh, on, you know, decisions related to, to things like productization, deployment, revenue generation. Dario, you were just talking about how, like, this is different. <laughs> yeah, this is different than making widgets. Um, or, uh, you know, uh, electric cars. Um, and, uh, one way that it's different from widgets is that it might lead to, uh, massive economic windfalls. Um, so, uh, <laughs> unless you make really good widgets, um, or like widgets that can solve problems in the world. Um, <laughs> so, um, what is, what is, what is Anthropic's view on, uh, the, vast economic benefits that can come from powerful uh, AI systems. Um, and what role is it that you see, uh, I guess, uh, C company AGI labs playing in the beneficial use and uh, of that windfall? Niela, you want to go? Go for it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think like, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of a way to think about it is, you know, yeah, assuming we can avoid the alignment problems and some other problems, like then there will be massive economic benefits from, you know, from AI or AGI or TAI or like whatever you want to call it, or just, just AI getting more powerful over time. Um, and then again, thinking about, thinking about all the other problems that I haven't listed, which is, you know, today's short-term problems and, you know, <laughs> problems with, with like fairness and bias and long-term alignment problems and problems that you might encounter with policy and geopolitics, Assuming we address all those, then then there there is still this issue of like economic, uh, yeah, like are are those benefits evenly distributed? Um, and so here here as elsewhere, uh, like you know, I think I think it's unlikely those benefits will all accrue to one company or organization. I think this is bigger than one company or one organization and is a broader societal problem. But you know, we we would certainly we would certainly like to do our part on this, um, and this is something we've been thinking about and are, you know, working on putting, yeah, putting programs in place with, with respect to, we don't, we don't have anything to share about it at this time. 
Um, uh, but but this is uh, this is like something that's very much very much on our mind. Um, I would say that more broadly, you know, I think like the economic distribution of benefits is maybe maybe one of only many many issues that will come up. Which is that you know I think the dis- yeah like the disruptions to s- society that you can imagine coming from you know like the advent of more powerful intelligence. Are, are not just economic. I mean, they're already causing disruptions today. People already have legitimate and very severe societal concerns about, you know, things that models are doing today. And you can call them mundane relative to, you know, all the existential risk. But I think, yeah, I, I think there, I think there are already serious concerns about concentration of power, um, fairness and bias in these models, making sure that they benefit everyone, which, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that they do yet. Um, uh, and if we then put together with that the ingredient of the models getting more powerful, maybe even on an exponential curve, you know, the, the, you know, yeah, those those things are set to get worse without without intervention. Um, and I think economics is only one is only one dimension of that. So, you know, again, like I, I just I just don't like these are bigger than any one company. I don't think it's within our power to like fix them. Um, but we should we should do our part. We should do our part to be we should do our part to be good citizens and we should try and release release applications that make these problems better rather than worse yeah that's that's excellently put um i guess one thing i'd 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 be interested in is if you could uh i guess give some more examples about these problems that exist with current day systems and then the real relationship that they have to um you know issues with economic windfall and also existential risk um i think it seems to me like tying these things together is really important um, at least seeing like the interdependence and relationship there. Um, the, 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 some of these, the, some of these problems already exist or we already have, uh, you know, example problems that'll be really, that are really important to address. Uh, so could you, could you expand on that a bit? I think maybe the most obvious one for current day problems is like, you know, people are worried very legitimately that, uh, that like big models suffer from problems of like bias, fairness, toxicity, and accuracy. Um, like, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to apply my model in some medical, medical application. Um, uh, and it, it gives the wrong diagnosis or it gives me misinformation or it fabricates information. Like that's just, that's just not good. These models aren't usable and they're, they're harmful if you try and use them. Um, like I think toxicity and bias are issues when models are trained on data from the internet. Uh, they, um, yeah, they, they absorb, they absorb the, the biases of that data. And there's, maybe even more subtle algorithmic versions of that where, you know, I, I hinted at it a little before where it's like, um, you know, like the objective function of the model is to say something that sounds like what a human would say or what a human on the internet would say. And so in a way, almost like fabrication is kind of like baked into the objective function. Um, uh, and yeah, potentially even bias and stereotyping, you could, you could imagine being, being baked into the objective function in some way. So, you know, just, in a, it, you know, these models are being used for, or, you know, want to be used for, you know, very mundane, mundane, everyday things like, you know, like, you know, like, like, you know, like, help, you know, like helping people write emails or, um, you know, kind of, you know, you know, like helping with with, you know, customer surveys or collecting customer data. And if they're if they're subtly biased or subtly inaccurate, then, you know, those biases and those inaccuracies will be will be inserted into the into the stream of economic activity in a way that that may be difficult to detect. Um, so that that seems bad, and I think we should try to solve those problems before before we deploy the models. Um, but but also they're not they're not as different from the large scale problems as they might uh, as they might seem. Um, in terms of the economic inequality, I don't know. Just look at the look at the market capitalization of the the top the top five tech companies in the world. Um, and yeah, you know compare compare that to the <laughs> compare that to the U.S. to the U.S. economy. There's there's clearly. Um, there, there's there's clearly something something going on in the concentration of wealth. I would just echo every everything Dario said, and and also sort of sort of add, you know, I think I think something that is a sort of especially kind of can can be you know alarming in sort of a short term way today, in in the sense that it could belie things to come, is how um, quietly and seamlessly like people are becoming dependent on some of these systems, right? We don't necessarily even know, right? There's no required disclosure of when you're interacting with an AI system versus a human. And, you know, re- until very recently, it was that was sort of like a comical idea because it was so obvious when you were interacting with a person, right? Versus versus not not a person, right? You like 
know when you're when you're you know on a customer chat and it's a, a human on the other end versus you know a, an automated system responding to you. But I think that line is kind of getting increasingly blurred, and I can imagine that even just in the next few years that that could start to have fairly fairly you know reasonably large ramifications for people in day to day ways. Right? Um, people talk to an online therapist now, and sometimes that is you know backed by a, a, like an AI system that is that is giving advice, right? Or, you know, down the road, we could imagine things looking completely, completely different in, in, in health realms like Dario talked about. And so I think it's just really important as we're kind of stepping into this new world to be really thoughtful about a lot of the safety problems that he just that he just outlined and and talked about, because I think I don't know that most people necessarily even even know all the ways in which AI is is, um, is impacting our, our kind of day to day lives today and, and the potential that 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 could really go up in 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 the near future. The idea of like AI is, uh, you know, there being kind of like a requirement of AI is disclosing themselves as AI is is, is is seems very interesting and also adjacent to this idea of um, kind of like the way that, uh, you know, uh uh, C corporations have fiduciary responsibility to shareholders. Uh, having AI systems that also have some kinds of um, responsibility towards the people that they serve, mm. um, where they can't be, you know, secretly uh, working towards the interests of the <laughs> the tech company yeah. that uh, is has the AI uh, listening to you in your house all the time. Yeah, it's um, like another direction you can <laughs> you can imagine. It's like you know, I talk to the I talked to an AI produced by Megacorp and it kind of like subtly steers my life <laughs> to the benefit of Megacorp. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, there's lots of things you can come up with like this. You know, these are sort of important problems today. And I, and I think they also really belie, you know, things that could be coming in, in the near future. Right. And, and I think solving like, you know, whatever those particular problems are, are, are ones lots of groups are working on, but I think, helping to solve a lot of the sort of fundamental um, building blocks underlying them, right, about getting models to be truthful, to be harmless, to be honest, right? All of all of those, uh, the, a lot of the goals are kind of aligned there, both for sort of short, medium, and, and, and potentially long-term safety. So, Dari, you mentioned earlier that uh, of the research that you publish, one of your hopes is that other organizations will look into and expand the research that you're doing. So I'm I'm, I'm curious uh, if Anthropic has a, a, a plan to communicate its work and its ideas about how to develop AGI safely um, with both technical safety researchers as well as with policymakers. Yeah, maybe I'll I'll actually jump in on this one, and and Dario, feel free to to add as much as you like. But uh, you know, I actually think this is a really important question. I think you know, po- like communication with policymakers and and sort of you know about safety with with other labs in the form of papers that we publish is something that's that's very important to us at Anthropic. We have a policy team. It's it's like one point five people right now, so we're hiring. That's kind of a, a plug as well. But I think their goal is to really take the technical content that we are developing at Anthropic and translate that into something that is actionable and practical for for policymakers. And I think this is this is really important because the concepts are are very complex, right? And so it's kind of a special skill to be able to take things that are that are um, you know highly technical, like potentially very important, and translate that into into recommendations or work with policymakers to come up with recommendations that could potentially have very sort of far reaching consequences. So. To point to a couple of things, you know, we've we've been working on here. We've been supporting NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, on developing something called an, an AI risk management framework. And the goal of that is really developing more uh, monitoring tools around, uh, you know, AI risk and and AI risk management. We've also been supporting efforts in the U.S. and and sort of internationally to think about how we can best sort of support academic experimentation, which we which we talked about a little bit earlier with with large scale. Uh, compute models too. You guys also talked a lot about um, open endedness, and um, what was was part of all this uh, s- this alignment and safety research looking into um, ways of measuring uh, safety and open endedness. Yeah, there's actually some interesting work. Um, <clears throat> which I think is also in this upcoming paper and sort of in various other places that, that we've been looking into around sort of the concept of like AI evaluations or AI monitoring. And I think both of those are, are you know, potentially really, really important because 
a lot of what we're sort of um, seeing or, or maybe lacking, and this kind of goes back to this this point I made earlier about kind of standards, is just how do we how do we even have a common language or a common framework within the AI field of of what what kind of outputs or metrics we we care about measuring, right? And until we sort of have that common language or framework, it's sort of hard to set things like like standards across the industry around what safety you know, even means. And so I think AI evaluations is kind of another area that our, our societal impacts team, uh, which is also like a, this, the other half of, of the one and a half people in policy. So it's one point, it's also 1.5 people is, is something that they've been working on as well. Right. So a, a large part of this, um, this safety problem is, uh, of course, the technical aspect of how you, you know, train systems and create systems that um, are safe and aligned with human preferences and values. Um how do you guys view and see the larger problem of um, AI governance and um, the role and importance of governments and, and civil society in uh, working towards uh, the safe and beneficial use and deployment of AI systems? Yeah, we, we talked about this little one early, this one sort of a, a little bit earlier, and, and maybe I'll start here and, and obviously Dario jump in if you want. But, you know, I do think that these other kind of institutions that you talked about have this, this really important, you know, role to play. And, and again, one of the things we sort of, you know, mention in, in this paper is that we, we think, you know, government has already been starting to, to fund a lot more, you know, academic safety research. And I think that's an area that, that we sort of, a, a concrete policy recommendation is, you know, hey, go, go, go do more of that. That would be great. Uh, but I also think groups like, you know, civil society and, and NGOs, there's a lot of great organizations in, in this space, including FLI and, and others, um, that, that are thinking about like, what, what do we, what do we do, right? Like what, say we develop something really powerful, like what's the next step, right? Is whether that's, you know, at an industry lab, in government, in academia, wherever. Um, and I think there's, there's a way that just sort of, industry incentives are not the same as as nonprofit groups or as civil society groups. And I think to kind of go back to this analogy of an ecosystem, we really need thoughtful and empowered uh, organizations that are working on on these kinds of questions fundamentally sort of outside of the industry in the industry sphere in addition to the kind of you know policy you know research and work that's that's being done at, at labs. Another, yeah, I mean, another way you can think of things <clears throat> kind of in line with this is like, uh, you know, I think maybe, uh, you know, at some point, you know, laws and regulations are going to be written. Um, and I think probably those laws and regulations work best if they end up being formalizations of what's realized to be the best practices. Um, and those best practices can come from di different industrial players. They can come from academics figuring out what's good and what's not. They can come from nonprofit players. But, you know, if you if you kind of try and write a law ahead of time, often, you, you know, you don't you don't know um, what, um, you know, if you write a law that relates to a technology that hasn't been invented yet, it's often not clear what the what the best thing to do is and what, you know, what 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 is actually going to work or make sense or even what categories or words to use. Um, but if if something has become a best practice and folks have converged on that and then then kind of the law formalizes it and puts it in place that can often be a very constructive way for for things to happen anthropic has received uh, a lot of uh, an impressive amount of uh, series a funding um, and um, so it seems like you guys are doing a lot of hiring and and growing considerably um, so in, in case there's anyone in from our audience that's interested in uh, joining anthropic, um, what are the types of roles that you, you expect to be hiring for? Yes, great question. Uh, we are definitely hiring. We're hiring a lot. And so I think the the sort of number one thing I would say is is if you're you're listening to this podcast and you're interested, I would highly recommend ch just checking out our jobs page because that will be the the sort of most most up to date and that's just anthropic dot com with on the quite a careers tab, but we can also send that around if that's helpful. But uh, what are we looking to hire? Quite a few things. So, most critically, probably right now, we're looking to hire engineers, and we're actually very bottlenecked on on engineering talent right now. And that's because you know running experiments on AI systems is something that requires you know a lot of of custom software and and tooling. And while machine learning experience is helpful for that, it it isn't necessarily 
you know, required. Um, and I think a lot of our sort of best, you know, ML engineers or research engineers came from a software engineering or sort of infrastructure engineering background, hadn't necessarily worked in ML before, but were just really excited to, to learn. And so I think if that kind of describes you, if you're a software engineer, but you're really interested in these topics, um, you know, definitely think about applying because I think there's a lot of value uh, that, that, that your skills can, can provide. Uh, we're, we're also looking for just sort of a, a number of, of other roles. I kind of won't be able to list them all. You should just check out our jobs page. But off the top of my head, we're looking for front-end engineers to help with things like interfaces and, and tooling for the, the research we're doing internally. We're looking for policy experts, uh, operations people, security engineers, um, security, data visualization security. people. Security. Security, security yes. Support. We're definitely looking If you're building big models. <laughs> yes. Security is something that Every I think is kind of... Every industrial lab should... should should make sure yeah. their models are not stolen by bad actors. This is sort of a unanimous kind of thing in, you know, across all labs, right? There's something everyone really agrees on in, in industry and, and, and outside of industry, which is that security is really important. And so if you are interested in security or you have a security background, uh, we would definitely love to hear from you. Or I'm sure our, our, our friends at other industry labs and, and non-industry labs would also love to hear from you. Uh, I, I would also say, you know, I, I sort of talked about this a little bit before, but we've also just kind of had a lot of success in, in hiring people who were very accomplished in other uh, fields, especially other technical fields. And so we've alluded a few times to, uh, you know, f former, you know, recovering physicists or people who have PhDs in, in computer science or, or ML, neuroscientists, computational biologists. And so I think if you're someone who has, you know, sort of this this strong background and, and sort of set of interests in a, in a technical field that's like, you know, not... A, related to ML, but sort of moderately adjacent, uh, I would also consider applying for our residency program. Um, and so I think, again, you know, if you're even a little curious, I would say just check out our job page because there's going to be more more information there. But those are sort of the ones off the off the top of my head. And Dario, if I missed any, like, please, please jump in. Yeah, I mean, that that covers a <clears throat> that covers a pretty that covers a pretty wide range. Could you tell me a little bit more about the the, the team and, and and what it's like uh, working at Anthropic? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you'll probably have to cut me off here because I'll talk forever about this because I think Anthropic is a great team. But uh, uh, some basic stats: we're about thirty five people now. Uh, we come, like I've you know said a, a few times, we've kind of come from a really wide range of of backgrounds. So this is people you know who worked in in uh, you know tech companies as software engineers. These are former academics in in you know physics, uh, ethics, uh, neuroscience, a, a lot of different different areas. Machine learning researchers, uh, policy people, operations staff, like so much more. And I think one of the kind of unifying themes that I would sort of point to in, in our employees is kind of a, a, a combination of like a set of two impulses that I think we've we've kind of talked about a lot in this in this podcast. And I think the first is is really a, a just a genuine desire to reduce the the risks and and increase the potential benefits from from AI. And I think the second is kind of a deep curiosity to really scientifically and empirically describe, understand, uh, predict, model out how AI systems work and and kind of through that deeper understanding, make them safer and more reliable. And I think some of our employees, you know, identify as effective altruists, which means they're sort of especially worried about the potential for, for long-term harms from AI. And I think others are sort of more concerned about immediate or sort of emerging risks that that are that are happening today or or in the near future. And I think, you know, both of those views are sort of very compatible with the goals that I just kind of talked about, and I think they often just call for sort of a mixed method approach to research, which I think is is sort of very very a very accurate description of kind of how how things look in a day-to-day -day way at, at Anthropic. Um it's a very collaborative environment, so there's not a very strong distinction between, you know, research and engineering. Researchers write code. Uh, engineers contribute to research. There's a very strong culture of sort of pair programming across and within teams. Um, there's a very strong focus on learning. I think this is also just because so many of us come from backgrounds that were not necessarily ML-focused uh, in, in where we started, so people run these, like, very nice, you know, little training courses where they'll say, hey, if you're interested in learning more about transformers, um, I'm a transformers expert and I'll kind of walk you through it at sort of different levels of technical skills so that people from, uh, you know, the operations team or the policy team can kind of come for the for the sort of introduction an introductory version. Um, and then I think outside of that, you know, I think I like to think we're a nice group of people. We all have lunch together every day. We have this, you know, very lovely office space in, in San Francisco. It's fairly well attended. Um, and I think, you know, we 
have lots of fun lunch conversations ranging from things like, you know, a, a recent one was we were sort of talking about uh, uh, micro COVID. If you know the concept of micro COVID, Catherine Olson, who's, who's kind of one of the creators of microcovid.org, which is basically a way of like, but, you know, assessing the level of risk from a given interaction or sort of a given activity that you're doing during COVID time. So we, we had this sort of like fun meta conversation where we're like, how risky is this conversation that we're having right now from a micro COVID perspective if we like all came into the office and tested, uh, but we're still like sort of together indoors and there's like 15 of us. What does that mean? So anyway, I think it's it's a it's a fun place to work. Uh, we've, we've obviously had a lot of fun, you know, kind of getting to build it together. Yeah, the, the things that stand out to me are <clears throat> trust and common purpose. They're enormous force multipliers um, where, you know, it, it shows up in all, in all kinds of little things where if you have, you know, you can think about it in things like, like compute allocation. Like, you know, if people are not on the same page, if one person wants to advance, you know, one research agenda and the other wants to advance their other research agenda, then people fight over it. And there's a lot of zero sum or negative sum interactions. But if everyone has the attitude of like, we're, we're 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 trying to do this thing. Everything we're trying to do is is in line with with you know with this 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 common purpose, and we all trust each other to do what's right to advance this common purpose. Um, then yeah, it, it it just it really becomes a force multiplier on you know like getting things done while keeping the environment like comfortable and while everyone continues to, continues to get along with each other. Um, I think it's I think it's an enormous. Uh, I think it's an enormous superpower um, that, yeah, <laughs> that I haven't seen before. So uh, you, you mentioned that you're hiring a lot of technical people from a wide variety of uh, technical backgrounds. Could you tell me a little bit more about your, your choice to do that rather than simply hiring people who are traditionally experienced in ML and AI? Yeah, that's a great question. So I should also say, you know, we have people from from kind of both camps that you talked about, but... <clears throat> Why did we choose to to um, kind of bring people in from sort of outside the field? I think there's a, f a few reasons for this. I think one is, you know, again, ML and AI is still a fairly a fairly new field, right? Not 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 super new, but still pretty new. And so what that means is there's kind of a, a lot of opportunity for people who have not necessarily worked in this field before to to kind of get into it. And I think we've had sort of a lot of of uh, of success or kind of luck with taking people who are are really talented in kind of a related field and helping to take their skills and translate them to the ones in in sort of ML and, and AI safety. And I think the second reason is so one is just you know expanding the talent pool. I think the other is is it really does broaden the range of perspectives uh, and and the types of people who are working uh, on on these issues, which we think are very important. And again, we've talked about this you know previously, but having a wider range of of views and kind of perspectives and approaches tends to lead to a more robust approach to doing to doing both basic research and, and safety research. Yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing to add to that. Um, I mean, I think. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 really I'm I'm just I'm surprised at how often someone who has experience in a different field can can come in and it, it's not like they're like it's not like they're directly applying things that come but they they think about things in a different way um, and yeah I mean this is you know of course this is true about all kinds of things you know this is this is true about you know like yeah this is this is true about diversity in the more in the more traditional senses as well but you you want as many different kinds of people as you can as you can get. So as we're we're wrapping up here, uh, I'm curious just to get some more perspective on you guys about, you know, given these large scale models, the importance of safety and alignment and the problems which exist today, but also the promises of uh, the impact they could have for the benefit of, of people. What, what are, what's a future that that each of you is is excited about or what's the future that you're hopeful for um, given your work at Anthropic and um, the future impacts of AI? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe, I'll, I'll start. Uh, so I think, you know, one one thing I do believe is I actually, I am really hopeful about the future. I know that there's a, a lot of, of challenges that we have to face to get to a, a, a sort of a potentially, you know, really positive place. But I, I think, um, I think the field will rise to the occasion, or that's kind of my hope. And I think some things I'm sort of hoping for in the next few years is that a lot of different groups will be developing more practical tools, uh, techniques for advancing safety research. And I sort of, um, I sort of think, you know, 
these are, are likely to hopefully become more, more widely available if we can sort of set the right norms in, in the community. And I think the more people working on safety related topics, like that can, that can sort of positively feed on itself, right? And I think I'm, I'm most broadly hoping for a world where we can feel confident that when we're, we're using AI for more advanced purposes, like, you know, accelerating scientific research, that, that it's behaving in ways where we can be very confident and, and sure that we understand that it's, it's not going to lead to negative unintended consequences. And the reason for that is because we've really taken the time to chart them out and, and understand what, what all of those potential, you know, um, um, problems could, could be. And so I think that's obviously a very ambitious goal. But I think if we can make all of that happen, you know, there's a lot of potential benefits of, of more advanced AI systems that I think could be transformative for, for the world, right? From almost anything you can name, right? Renewable energy, health, disease detection, uh, economic growth, and, and sort of lots of other just day-to-day -day enhancements to kind of how we, we kind of work and, and communicate and, and live together. No one really knows what, what's going to happen in the future. It's extremely, it's extremely hard to predict. And so I, I often find any, any question about the future, it's, it's, it's more about the, the attitude or posture that, that you want to take than, than it is about, about concrete predictions. Because I, 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 I feel like particularly after you go a few, few years out, it's, it's just, it's just very hard to, it's very hard to know what's going to happen. And so, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's mostly, it's mostly just speculation. And so in terms of attitude, I think, well, first of all, I think the two attitudes that I find least useful are like blind pessimism and blind optimism. Um, uh, because, uh, they're, they're actually sort of, you know, like doom, dooms, doom sane and like Pollyannaism. Um, and it, you know, it's possible, it, it weirdly is possible to have both at once. Um, uh, but I think it's just it's just not very useful because it's like you know like we're all we're all we're all doomed. It's it's intended to create fear or it's intended to create uh, to create complacency. Um, I, I I find that an attitude that's that's more useful is to just say, well, we we don't know what's going to happen, but like let's as as an individual or as an organization, like let's pick a place where there's a problem we think we can help with. And let's try and make things go a little better than they would have otherwise. Um, maybe we'll have a small impact. Maybe we'll have a big impact. Um, but let's, you know, instead of instead of trying to understand what's going to happen with the whole system, let's let's try and intervene w in a way that helps with 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 something that we feel well that we feel feel well equipped to help with. And of course, the whole outcome is you know it's going to be beyond the scope of one person, one organization, even you know even even one country. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think we find that to be, to be a more, um, to, to, to be a more effective way of thinking about things. And, and for us, you know, for us, that's, can we help to address some of these, uh, safety problems that we have with AI systems in a way that is robust and enduring and that points towards the future? Um, uh, you know, yeah, if we can, if we can increase the probability of things going well by only some, some very, some very small amount, um, you know, that, that, that may, that may well be the, that may well be the most, the most that we can do. Um, you know, I think from, from our perspective, it would be, you know, the, th the things that, that I would really like to see are, I would, I would like it if AI could, could do, could, you know, advance science, technology, and health, um, in a way that's, that's equitable for everyone and uh, that it could help everyone to make better decisions and improve human society. And right now, I frankly don't really trust the AI systems we build today to do any of those things. Um, uh, you know, even, even if it were technically capable of, of like the task, which it's not, um, I wouldn't trust it to do those things in a way that makes society better rather than worse. And so I'd like us, I'd like us to do our part to, to, to make it more likely that we could, we could trust trust AI systems in that, in that way. Uh, and if we can make a small contribution to that while, while being good citizens in the, in the broader ecosystem, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's maybe the best we can hope for. All right. And so if people want to check out uh, more of your work or to follow you on social media, uh, where are the best places to do that? Yeah, uh, on Anthropic.com is going to be the best place to see most of the recent stuff we've we've worked on. Uh, I don't know if we have everything posted, but but yeah, we probably we're, we're about because we have several papers out, so we're now we're now about to 
post post uh, <laughs> post links to them on the website. In an easy to find place, uh, and then we also have a Twitter handle. It's just I think it's Entropic yeah. um, on on Twitter, and uh, yeah, and we generally re- you know also tweet about our our recent uh, releases yeah. of, of all we the are events. we are we are relatively low key. We really want to be we really want to be focused on the research and not not get uh, not get not get distracted. Um, so yeah, I mean the stuff we do the stuff we do is out there, but we're we're very focused on like the research itself and, you know, getting it out and letting it speak for itself. Okay. So where, where's the best place on, on Twitter to follow Anthropic? It's, uh, uh the, our Twitter handle is at Anthropic AI. All right. I'll include a link to that in uh, the description of wherever you're listening. Uh, thanks a ton for coming on Dario and Daniela. It's really been awesome and a lot of fun. Um, I'll include links to Anthropic in the description. Um, it's a pleasure having you and yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us, Lucas. This was really fun.